Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I would like to call this meeting of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources to order. Uh, welcome to our first meeting of the 2021 to 2022 interim. Uh, first, before we start, I would like to note that I am joining this meeting from the ancestral homeland of the Nuwu or Southern Paiute people. Uh, our members represent and our state occupies the unceded homelands of the Nuwu, the Nui or Western Shoshone, the Numu or Northern Paiute, and the Washishu or Washoe peoples, currently represented by 27 sovereign, sovereign tribal nations located wholly or partially within the state's boundaries. And I want to take a moment to honor their stewardship of the area's lands and waters from time immemorial to present day and intend to include their voices in this committee's uh, work and work with them to protect and restore these places for future generations. Uh, members, as we proceed through the meeting, please remember to keep your video on so that we can uh, ensure that we're maintaining a quorum and be sure to mute your microphone when you are not speaking in order to minimize background noise. With that, uh, Mr. Stinisbeck, will you please call the roll? Senator Donyate. Here. Senator Cocochia. Here. Senator Scheibel. Assemblywoman Carlton. Here. Assemblyman Ellison. Present. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Peters. Here. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Thank you. We have seven members present. We have a quorum. Please mark Senator Scheibel present when she arrives. She did indicate she'll be a little late to the meeting today. Uh, members, our agenda for today will include introductions, the appointment of members to our subcommittee on public lands, a discussion of possible topics to study during the interim, and presentations from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources and the Department of Wildlife. Uh, before we get to that, though, I'd like to make uh, several housekeeping announcements as we get started for the interim. Of course, we are meeting virtually today. Uh, we hope to hold future meetings in person and we'll keep members of the committee and the public updated on that. During the interim, meetings typically have two opportunities for public comment, once at the beginning and once at the end of the meeting. Members of the public may provide testimony in different ways, all of which are posted on our meeting agendas. Uh, to call in for public testimony, dial 669-900-6833. When prompted, provide the meeting ID 860-8513-0058 and then press pound. Our broadcast and production services staff will indicate to you when it's your turn to speak. We do ask that public comment made by phone be kept to three minutes so that everyone interested in speaking can be accommodated and to ensure that we get through the agenda in a timely fashion. Speakers are urged to avoid repetition of comments made by previous speakers. If you'd like to provide written comments, please either submit them electronically uh, before, during, or after our meetings by email to nrinterim at lcb.state.nv.us or you can mail them to the research division at 401 South Carson Street, Carson City, Nevada, 89701. Uh, and for those who still have fax machines, you can fax them to 775-684-6400. With that, um, we will begin our agenda with our first public comment period of the day. Please be sure to clearly state and spell your name and limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to our staff and broadcast production services to see if we have anyone wishing to make public comment at this time and to please add our first caller to the meeting. Thank you so much, Chair Watts. If you'd like to provide public comment at this time, please press raise hand in your Zoom window or star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 015, you're unmuted and may begin. Yes, 
Yes, good morning. For the record, Fred Voltz, V as in Victor, O-L-T-Z. We can likely agree that when a building's foundation has collapsed, it cannot be fixed. The State Wildlife Commission and the County Advisory Boards are regressive, duplicate anachronisms of 1922 state demographics, not 2022. Both bodies' actions fail to represent the values and objectives of most Nevadans toward the public's wildlife, per a recent NDAO-sponsored wildlife value study carefully conducted by Colorado State University researchers. Despite a few tweaks by previous legislatures, the membership of both bodies reliably promotes only the interests of maximized wildlife killing. Wildlife killing contests wipe out entire populations of a target species in a given geographic area while posing a risk to public safety. A brutal 96-hour trap inspection requirement ranking 48th worst out of 50 states destroys non-target species as well. A trophy bear hunt has negatively impacted a guesstimated small population. Deer hunts further deplete population numbers already precipitously declining year over year because of degraded habitat and serial drought. Subjective opinions, not sound science, drive these bad decisions. Let's remember 95% of Nevadans do not buy wildlife killing licenses, yet they are defiantly ignored when policies are made. Most commission and board membership positions mandate the patronage purchase of a wildlife killing license, pay to play, in three out of the last four years as initial imaginary proof of competency to serve. A recent analysis of the 17 cabs over a three-year period proves that out of 27 commission meetings they are statutorily required to attend, one to eight cabs actually attended 13 meetings. The high point of attendance was 12 cabs out of 17 on only three occasions. Nevada spends over $43 million of public funds per fiscal year for roughly 240 NDAL employees. With reform of its current institutional bias toward maximizing wildlife killing license sales and wildlife killer convenience, opportunity, and success, NDAL already possesses the regulation writing and day-to-day -day skills, not the funding, needed to protect all of our over 700 identified wildlife species from decimation and extinction. Two of your 14 BDR slots need to completely abolish the State Wildlife Commission and County Advisory Boards. Their inherent and intractable problems cannot be credibly glossed over any more than a collapsed building can be repaired. And I will ask that these comments be added to the record verbatim as well as the chart uh, documenting the cab problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Voltz. Uh, broadcast Production Services, can we do, move on to the next caller? Thank you, Chair Watts. If you've recently joined the call this morning and you'd like to provide public comment at this time, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 015. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Once again, caller with the last three digits, 015. Please press star six to unmute. Thank you, caller. You may proceed. You are unmuted at this time. And Chair Watts, it seems our caller is unresponsive. And with that, you have no more callers at this time. All right, thank you. Uh, and to the other caller, uh, we will have another public comment period. So if you wish to wait, you can uh, give it a try then, or you can also submit your comments in writing. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the next uh, item on our agenda, which is committee member and staff introductions. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to um, allow everyone to introduce themselves. So uh, members, we'll start with you. 
uh, you know, we'll keep it brief. If you can just please note the district you represent and your uh, history with the natural resources or public lands committees. Um, we'll begin our introductions with our vice chair, Senator Doniate. Thank you so much, Chair Watts, and good morning to the members. Uh, Senator Doniate representing Senate District 10, which is in the heart of Las Vegas. Very happy to be here today. Uh, I served as the former chair of the Senate Natural Resources Committee in the 81st legislative session. So I definitely have an interest in this subject. Of course, um, I'm excited to talk about water and climate change um, and environmental health. So looking forward to working alongside all of you and continuing the conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to Senator Goykachia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Pete Goykachia representing Senate District 19. I guess it continues to be the largest uh, Senate district in the state, predominantly rural Nevada, although I do get into the, uh, the west side of the Las Vegas Valley. Uh, I had the privilege of serving on the Public Lands Interim Committee on Public Lands as a county commissioner twice uh, before I actually was elected to the legislature, and I believe I've been on uh, the Committee on Natural Resources ever since. So. Uh, again, I'm a rancher, third generation rancher. Natural resources are very near and dear to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, I believe Senator Scheibel hasn't joined us yet. So we'll move on to uh, Assemblywoman Carlton. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and those watching. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very grateful to be appointed to this committee. Uh, once again, I've served off and on on natural resources through my uh, career in the legislature, in the Senate, and in the Assembly, and was actually um, on natural resources with Senator Rhodes, who started this committee a very long time ago and was lucky enough to be the first Southerner, the first Democrat, and the first woman to ever chair this committee. So I really look forward to the work that's going to get done. There's still a lot of things to do, and I appreciate the opportunity to work with everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to Assemblyman Ellison. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, John Ellison, Assembly District 33. Uh, I'm like uh, Mr. Gogachia. Uh, we come from a ranching background and uh, I've served on two different committees with uh, natural resources and, and I look forward to serving on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Assemblywoman Hansen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody. Um, I'm honored to be able to uh, represent Assembly District 32. I live in the Reno Sparks area, I have most of my life. Uh, my family has been in Nevada in uh, Lincoln County, Eureka County um, for five generations. Um, I represent six counties, uh, of course, a large section of Washoe and five other counties um, that have a, and, and tribe, a lot of tribal lands and, and I'm honored to do so. Uh, I look forward to serving this interim. I served um, on natural resources during the regular session in 2019. It was my first session, 2021. I also served on public lands um, and, and hope to be able to be a voice for my communities. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much. Uh, and Assemblywoman Peters. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Assemblywoman Sarah Peters. I represent District 24 in the North, Assembly District 24 in the North, which is the, um, the heart of Reno, really. Um, so I was on the Natural Resources Committee my first session in 2019. And then um, during the interim, I served on both the uh, TRPA Marla Lake Oversight Committee um, as the vice chair and on the wildfire study, uh, interim study during the 2019-2020 interim. Um, my day job, I spent a lot of time working in natural resources as an environmental engineer. Um, and I'm grateful to be here and participate in this um, interim conversation. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Welcome back to Natural Resources. 
And I am Howard Watts. Uh, it's my honor to serve with all of you uh, and to chair this first Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources and uh, help chart the, the course for our new revised interim structure. I represent District 15, uh, which currently covers Central East uh, Las Vegas. And I have served on the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources in both of my regular sessions, uh, serving as chair of the committee during the 81st session. I also served on the Committee on Public Lands uh, during the last interim, um, which as many of you are aware is uh, kind of the precursor to this uh, committee. Um, you know, before we move forward, I'd just like to, to give a few remarks. Um, you know, first of all, uh, I'm always impressed by the uh, depth of experience, the diverse backgrounds um, and, and geography of our members, not only of the legislature as a whole, um, but particularly of this committee um, and, and the way that that experience can be brought to bear to, to inform the decisions that we're making on our natural resources. And um, the work that we take on is, is more important than ever. You know, the science is clear that you know, the greenhouse effect is real, that human activity is causing it, and that our climate is changing as a result. Nevada is getting hotter, um, even hotter and drier, and that's putting our natural resources, our health, and our economy at risk. We've got two decades of aridification along the Colorado River. It's resulted in the first ever shortage being declared um, on the river, reducing Southern Nevada's water allocation by roughly 7 billion gallons this year. In other parts of the state, we've seen that drying trend drop snowpack and reservoir levels, leaving our agriculture and our recreation high and dry. You know, um, so many of us have either grown up here or spent a, a long time here and have seen uh, the changes to our landscape firsthand, including in 2020 when the summer monsoons never arrived. Uh, Reno and Las Vegas uh, are the fastest warming cities in the nation, and Las Vegas has the most intense summer heat island effect of any uh, U.S. city. We're breaking temperature records at an alarming pace, and for people who work outside, uh, or live without affordable quality cooling, this is becoming uh, downright dangerous. Since the 70s, the average number of fires over 1,000 acres each year has doubled in Nevada. And last August, several counties recorded their worst air quality ever due to wildfire smoke. Uh, I know uh, my colleagues uh, in the North experienced that firsthand. Uh, for the first time ever, fires jumped across the Sierra Crest and it happened twice in one year, destroying homes, businesses, and critical wildlife habitat. We're also struggling with air pollution, which leads to premature deaths and millions of dollars in increased healthcare costs. And pollution is concentrated in urban areas with high proportions of low-income Black and Hispanic residents. Other committees will be looking at how Nevada can lead our region and our nation in reducing emissions to avoid billions of dollars in uh, projected increased damages as a result of these problems. Our committee will, among other things, take a closer look at these impacts um, that are occurring and explore options to reduce the detri detrimental effects that we're seeing on Nevada's plants, animals, and people. Um, you know, as chair, I always strive to create um, an open uh, and inclusive environment and we will continue to do that in the interim and make ourselves open to diverse ideas. I think we'll, we'll see that even throughout the rest of this agenda. Um, I will continue to promote an environment of professionalism and fairness and expect all members and participants to treat each other with courtesy and respect. Um, with that, I'd like to now turn over our introductions to the nonpartisan committee staff who will support us during the interim. Uh, joining us are our committee policy analyst, Jan Stinnespeck, with the Research Division of the Legislative Council Bureau, or LCB. Uh, our research assistant, Becca Williams, also with the Research Division. We have our committee counsel, Alan Ambern, with the Legal Division of the LCB, who served as, uh, as counsel to both the Senate and Assembly uh, Committees on Natural Resources during the 81st session. And our fiscal analysts, uh, Kimber Ellsworth and Justin Luna with the Fiscal Division of the LCB. 
Additionally, to support the work of our subcommittee on public lands, we have Elisa Keller and Maria Aguayo with the research division joining us for this interim. And last but not least, uh, I would like to take a moment to recognize our excellent broadcast and production services staff who enable us and members of the public to participate in these meetings remotely and ensure that recordings of our meetings are available to everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do. Uh, with that, uh, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the presentation of our committee brief. Uh, our policy analyst, Mr. Stinnisbeck, will present the brief. Uh, please proceed whenever you are ready. Thank you, Chair. For the record, I'm Jan Stinnisbeck, the Research Division of the LCB. Uh, on the meeting page, you will find the committee brief of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources for a 2021 interim. The brief contains an overview of natural resource issues the committee may consider, uh, meeting dates, staff contacts, and other relevant information. As you know, Senate Bill 443 of the 2021 regular session created the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources and set its membership, uh, duties, powers, and jurisdiction. Additionally, the bill replaced the Legislative Committee on Public Lands with the Subcommittee on Public Lands of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources. Pair AB 443, the committee may request up to 14 bill draft requests, of which at least uh, four must be based on recommendations by the subcommittee. Uh, the, sub the committee has jurisdiction over a wide range of natural resources issues. During past sessions, the Senate and Assembly Committees on Natural Resources considered uh, measures related to uh, topics ranging from agriculture and animals over historic preservation, water and wildfires, as such, during the 2021 regular session, the Natural Resources Committees received a total of 55 measures, of which 44 were passed into law. These measures addressed a diverse set of issues. Some bills from last session that come to mind are Senate Bill 52, which created a dark sky program, and Assembly Bill 356, which made various changes relating to water conservation in Southern Nevada. There were also various bills that addressed wildfire issues, such as Senate Bill 89 and 100, which, among other things, authorized public private partnerships to combat uh, wildfires. Further, uh, the committee processed bills related to uh, water, agriculture, and protecting animals, um, like, for example, Assembly Bill 399, which provided certain protection to egg laying hens. The brief also lists a selection of relevant publications dealing with natural resource issues. And, for example, the, the last interim final reports for the last committee on public lands and the interim study concerning wildfires are listed. Additionally, there is a list of relevant uh, government agencies with a hyperlink to the Directory of State and Local Government for current contact information. As for the meeting dates, currently the committee has uh, following dates scheduled for future uh, meetings, February 28th, March 21st, June 16th, and August 22nd. And the subcommittee has meetings, uh, meeting dates scheduled on April 15th, uh, May 23rd, and June 27th. Uh, lastly, I just want to point out that as nonpartisan staff, that we can neither advocate for it or, or against anything that comes before this committee. As a policy analyst, I look forward to assisting the committee on any issues related to the committee. And additionally, I'm available to provide individual members with information, assisting, um, uh, information or assistance on a confidential basis on any topic. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Stinsbeck. Members, any questions for Mr. Stinsbeck about the uh, committee brief. All right, seeing none, thank you. We'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the appointment of members to the Subcommittee on Public Lands. As Mr. Stinsbeck noted, uh, Assembly Bill 443 created uh, a subcommittee on public lands um, within our Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources. And uh, as chair of that committee, it is my responsibility to appoint the members of that subcommittee. <clears throat> Four members must be selected uh, from this joint interim standing committee with two assembly members and two senators. Additionally, the subcommittee has one member representing the governing body of a local political subdivision and one member representing tribal governments in Nevada. Uh, at this point, I would like to announce uh, the appointment of the following members to serve on the subcommittee this interim. I will chair the subcommittee with Senator Scheibel serving as vice chair. Senator Goikachia and Assemblywoman Carlton will also serve on the subcommittee. 
Clark County Commissioner Justin Jones will be our local government representative and the tribal representative will be appointed at a later date as we are <clears throat> waiting on the recommendation of the Intertribal Council of Nevada. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our next agenda item, uh, which is a discussion of possible topics to study during the interim. Um, I do, uh, before we uh, open up this discussion among members, want to direct the committees and the public's attention to the solicitation of recommendations, which is posted on the committee's webpage and the meeting page. Um, and uh, as noted in the memo, the committee will hold a work session at a later date to consider uh, potential recommendations. All interested parties are encouraged to provide written recommendations by completing and submitting uh, the form on our webpage. Uh, please note that committee staff must receive recommendations no later than Friday, June 24th, 2022, in order to be considered. Uh, those uh, interested may also suggest issues um, that they would like to see our committee study um, by contacting our committee at nrinterim at lcb.state.nv.us. Uh, I believe in my introductory remarks, I already made clear my interest in looking at the, the impacts of a changing climate on our state and its natural resources. And I'm particularly interested in continuing to have our state lead the way in water conservation efforts. Do other uh, members have any um, topics of interest uh, that they'd like to express uh, to have the committee study at this time? Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair. Um, two things. Could you please um, mention the, the public lands uh, appointments again? I, I thought you said two assembly members, and I don't think I wrote. I got Assemblywoman Carlton. Did I get that wrong? That's correct, and I will be serving as the chair of the subcommittee. Oh, okay. So it includes you then in the two count. Okay. Yep, that's correct. <clears throat> and uh, let's see here. So... <laughs> I don't know if this is the place to suggest this, and I'm certainly glad that Assemblywoman Carlton is involved. I was hoping that we would have a representative from the assembly that maybe represented the rural districts on public lands. I know we have Senator Gogachia for the Senate side, but nobody on the assembly side representing the rural districts. So just wanted to kind of put that on the record. Um, as far as topics, and as since there is not an assembly member on public lands from the rurals, um, I really had planned to suggest this anyway, but it will be even more vital that we, I would like to see us study some of the, um, and there are some great studies out there between uh, where ranching and wildlife sort of interface, um, particularly with sage grouse populations, uh, the Smith Creek Ranch uh, uh, study that was done. There's some, there's some really excellent ranching communities in North Eastern Northwestern Elko County that have some very healthy uh, sage grouse populations and perhaps either a field trip um, to include visiting some of these communities. Um, I really would like to see a lot more engagement with those that are living on the land, being able to participate via either like town halls, uh, tours. Uh, I, I know how much it impacted me as a freshman legislator when I was able to visit a mining operation. So I would also encourage us to include ranching, um, farming, um, and included in some of the public land topics so we can understand the, the positive effects that a lot of these uh, ranches and farms have as a additional benefit to wildlife, what, what they bring to the table in benefiting our wildlife populations in those regions. So that would be my suggestion for now. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, I would like to note a couple of things. Um, first, uh, it is our full intention to have the uh, subcommittee uh, conduct remote meetings at locations across the state. Um, this was, uh, of course, how the, the uh, committee on Public Lands operated previously um, to go and, and um, you know get some of that hands-on experience across the state. So we are uh, fully intending to do that. 
Additionally, we're planning those meetings to be uh, adjacent to weekends to promote the opportunity for um, additional uh, activities outside of the meeting itself in order to get some of that hands-on experience with uh, ranching, mining, outdoor recreation, and other um, uh, natural resource um, um, ventures. So um, that is certainly something that we have planned. Um, also, I'll just take a moment to say again, um, you know, we have a, a lot of experience um, on this committee. Uh, everyone, of course, is welcome to uh, attend those subcommittee meetings, whether they're a member or not. Um, and I'd just like to, to take a moment. Um, you know, I, I actually didn't get a chance to, um, uh, I guess, give a, a praise to Assemblywoman Carlton uh, during the, the regular session. And uh, as noted in her introduction, uh, she's been a trailblazer in the legislature, a trailblazer in this committee, um, and uh, frankly was, uh, I think, the leading force to ensure that we had this subcommittee created um, so that we could continue to get out into the rural parts of Nevada, um, even as we restructured the interim. And so um, I'm honored to, to have her in her uh, final interim uh, join us on this committee, but I do appreciate your comments and uh, we will be sure to, to make sure that those voices are included and any recommendations that you have, please do share them with myself and committee staff um, to make sure that we incorporate that into the agenda. Uh, with that, we'll move on to Assemblywoman Peters. Uh, Senator, looks like you uh, have something you want to get in there, so go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just wanted to, I don't know the best way to notify you I have a question, but I, I was just kind of concerned, okay, there are the, uh, you know, technically the six uh, members serving on a subcommittee, but four of them are from this committee. Uh, wouldn't it be wise also to, or should we select alternates? Who's going to stand in and say if, say if I can't attend a meeting, then would it be Senator Donati by just automatically, or I think we need to address that as well. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk with staff. I believe the statute is silent on alternates for the subcommittee. However, the committee itself does have alternates uh, for members from each party and each house. Um, so I believe we can, we can uh, work something similarly if someone's unavailable to have somebody from the same house and party to uh, attend in their stead. Although you have a strong attendance record, Senator, I'm expecting you to be at all three of those subcommittee meetings. You never know. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Assemblywoman Peters now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity in participating in um, the uh, sharing our, our hopes for this committee at this point. Um, I am hoping that we can continue to look at and review um, a potential process for the state of Nevada to assess impacts of decisions on environmental justice challenges in the state. And I'd also um, hope that we can, and you and I have had a couple conversations outside of committees, um, me as chair of Health and Human Services, that we include discussions on environmental health risks due to climate change and the impacts that those are having on our communities. Thank you very much for that, Assemblywoman. And, uh... Yes, I look forward to uh, potential collaborations to discuss uh, the intersection of those uh, environmental challenges and health challenges. Uh, Vice Chair Donate. Thank you so much, Chair Watts. Um, building off on the conversation from Assemblywoman Peters, I'd love to see um, us conduct stakeholder meetings, perhaps a, an entire meeting uh, of our from the interim committee dedicated to talking about water, uh, specifically some of the findings that we have uh, detailed from AB 356. I think that part of it sets us, sets us up to conduct the interim study or to at least look at um, issues of water. So I think that's definitely something we should prioritize during the interim. And um, I have also received constituent requests to look at food waste. I think that's something that we can definitely uh, dig into, something that we didn't really talk about during the last session, but we can always build on it. 
and of course, uh, recycling. So all of this aligns with uh, what you mentioned earlier today. So thank you so much. And I look forward to talking about these issues. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, the uh, Division of Environmental Protection is actually conven convening a stakeholder group um, that is working on waste reduction issues, and uh, I look forward to having a, a presentation um, by representatives from that working group at some point during this interim. Uh, additionally, I appreciate you bringing up uh, water issues. Uh, that does uh, remind me, and I believe it is covered in the committee brief, that under Assembly Bill 356, um, we are tasked with uh, uh, studying issues of water conservation during this interim. Uh, and I do intend to have uh, at least one full meeting dedicated to water and water conservation issues. Um, and there will probably it'll probably be um, incorporated uh, to some degree in other uh, meetings and presentations as well. So thank you for that. Uh, any other feedback that members wish to share at this time? All right, um, thank you very much members. Uh, with that, we will move on to uh, the, the uh, meat of our agenda for today. We do have two departments um, here to uh, present to us. Uh, first up is going to be the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, one thing I'll say before we get started is that um, given that all members have a, a level of familiarity with the agencies and issues under this committee's jurisdiction, I've asked for presentations to kind of skip the introductory or 101 level and focus um, more on emerging issues, um, uh, the status of relevant legislation and its implementation, um, and then, uh, of course, to, to look at um, any of the climate impacts um, that these agencies are seeing. So with that, uh, welcome, Director Kroll. Um, please go ahead whenever you're ready. Uh, you can introduce yourself for the record and begin. Thank you, Chair Watch. Um, Brad Kroll, Director, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources for the record. I'm going to attempt to share my uh, screen here for the PowerPoint presentation I have for you today. Okay, and I believe that's working and, and can everyone hear me and also see the presentation? We can, thank you. Great. So um, uh, I appreciate, uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate you having us uh, here today and uh, the opportunity to present. I am gonna move through these first few slides um, rather quickly um, at, at, uh, at your request. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, but for those um, who maybe aren't familiar or don't uh, recall, um, DCNR is a very uh, wide ranging jurisdictional department. We've got eight divisions, four programs, 16 boards and commissions, and um, a total of 37 grant loan programs and, and, and counting um, in terms of uh, our, our financing uh, mechanisms. Um, you'll see a whole list, the full list of our boards and commissions here. Um, uh, they are active to different degrees, but we'll point out just for um, uh, so those who know. Uh, would f f helpful for those who, who may not know, but um, boards like the Board for Financing Water Projects, that is the uh, board within the D Division of Environmental Protection that administers the federal um, clean water and drinking water state revolving loan funds um, to fund uh, water uh, projects and infrastructure around the state and um, received a significant uh, increase in funding uh, through the uh, uh, federal infrastructure bill that was passed recently, and um, that will help meet demand in a significant way. Um, I also point out uh, just one more of our boards and commissions, which is the State Environmental Commission. Many of you, uh, all of you, I'm sure are familiar with the State Environmental Commission. Um, and I just point it out because it is uh, our most active commission and the workload is increasing. And uh, it's probably going to be necessary here in the very near term to look at the uh, staff and funding adequacy for that commission to do all it needs to do um, in both a uh, oversight capacity and in a um, proactive um, uh, respect to uh, looking at our environmental laws and regulations. Um, I'll uh, just uh, note this slide and, and move forward, but this is an overview of all the things that um, uh, 
we see as our mission within the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. These next few slides are very um, uh, short uh, overviews of our eight divisions and four programs, which you can uh, go through at your leisure and see some of the top line statistics and jurisdictional areas for um, our various um, uh, divisions and, and programs within the, um, the department. Uh, note here on this first slide, the Division of State Lands also serves as the um, uh, as the division that helps with the majority of our work in Lake Tahoe. And our newest division, um, I, I just want to mention quickly, is our Division of Outdoor Recreation, which is up and running, um, has uh, doubled its staff uh, recently from one to two. Uh, but we are continuing to grow and do um, lots, even with that um, staff. And the um, new lieutenant, appointed lieutenant governor serves as the chair of the board of the Division of Outdoor Recreations Advisory Board. Um, these are our four programs. Um, the Sagebrush Ecosystem Program and the, and the um, uh, Conserve Nevada Program are two that I'm going to highlight later in this presentation. So I'll just uh, put a placeholder in there uh, that we will go over those two topics in a little bit more depth shortly. Um, and, and also say before I get into our legislative recap, many of the topics um, I'm going to reference or talk about today are also going to be complemented by uh, the presentation from my colleague, uh, Director Wasley at the uh, Department of uh, Wildlife for Nevada. Um, we work very closely together and there's obviously much overlap uh, in our um, in our mission space. And obviously that's why you have us here uh, co-presenting today. So during the 2021 uh, legislature, uh, for policy bills, the department had um, 19 bills introduced, 13 of those made their way through the process and were passed. Um, we had a number of um, bills that were uh, that we requested from an interim committee or did in concert with an interim committee, of which nine were introduced and seven were passed. Um, and then more broadly, um, in the context of all the legislation that the uh, legislature passed in the last session, uh, there were 27 uh, various policy bills with um, some level of impact on DCNR agencies and operations. Um, and we are uh, working to incorporate and get all of those off the ground um, as appropriate, uh, consistent with the timelines for implementation uh, outlined in the legislation. Uh, some of the new issues that um, <clears throat> we started to address in the last session, but obviously we, we need to address much more. And this was mentioned um, by some of the uh, the committee members uh, uh, earlier in this uh, discussion, which is um, looking at the impacts of uh, on historically underserved communities um, in the context of climate change, environmental protection and public health. Um, this is an emerging, uh, this is a, a long known need, but an emerging area of policy in terms of how to um, best address and manage those issues. And we look forward to working with the committee to find ways in which Nevada can, can um, address these issues and their impacts on um, those communities, uh, specifically in the interim and in the next legislative session. During the last uh, session, there were also some uh, critical, critically important issues that were not fully addressed. Um, some key ones were water uh, conservation and planning, uh, some uh, legislation related to off-highway vehicles, uh, enhancing our stage grass protection program, and then um, uh, significant any significant um, policies to uh, achieve the greenhouse gas reduction targets that we've set for the state. Um, much more obviously needs to be done on that going forward. As many of you uh, likely saw recently, the the Division of Environmental Protection issued its annual greenhouse gas inventory, and um, we are on target to come up uh, short of our 2025 goal and then significantly short of our 2030 goal uh, if we continue to operate only under current policies. So that will need to be looked at if we want to get to our targets. And I'll just note that uh, that work needs to begin now because uh, it takes some amount of runway in order to uh, get policies in place and then see the uh, emissions reductions uh, that uh, will come from those policies. Uh, I'm going to just go over a few of our specific legislative items um, that were that were passed in the last session, some of which were mentioned before and are incorporated in the, in the committee brief. Um, legislation uh, focused on protecting Nevada's lands and waters um, included the, uh, the four bills you see before you. Um, 
improving our ability to uh, manage uh, uh, spills and releases from petroleum tanks, um, looking at the extent of PFAS pollution uh, in the state and how to address it, uh, enhancing our program for um, protecting our, our waters from diffuse, diffuse sources of pollution. So think ag runoff, uh, urban uh, uh, runoff, things like that. Um, uh, the impact on, on streams from uh, wildfire scars, things, things of that nature. Um, we're also in the process of implementing uh, the, a, a bill related to preventing um, quote unquote bad actors in the mining industry in Nevada. Um, and this was a uh, Assemblywoman Peters, uh, this was her legislation that um, we appreciate her advancing and have been working with the mining industry to implement. And um, we are well into the process now and uh, working with LCB, which I know is, is very much overwhelmed in getting these things um, uh, drafted and out the door. So we're working on that. Uh, swamp cedars, a topic that this committee addressed um, during the last interim, uh, we are working with uh, our federal partners to find ways to better protect that uh, population of swamp cedars um, out in eastern, northeastern Nevada. Um, we can talk more about that or any of these topics as we go forward. Uh, catastrophic wildfires, a, a couple different bills were passed. Um, I, I will say that they're very helpful bills, but in terms of, of managing for wildfire, um, specifically preventing it and then rehabbing afterwards, um, it's gonna take a significantly greater investment um, of money, time, and resources. If we're going to get ahead of this issue, there is significant money um, in some of the federal uh, infrastructure bills, uh, in the federal infrastructure bill that was passed recently, but um, we need to make sure that Nevada is getting its fair share, that um, money that can come directly to the state that we are uh, both uh, applying for and uh, ready to receive it and put those dollars on the ground with, uh, I, I have some concern that the amount of dollars out there uh, is going to overwhelm our ability to actually get them on the ground uh, with our current with the current resources we have. But um, given the, the high proportion of federal land in Nevada, it's going to be, uh, as always, a matter of working closely with our partners to be strategic about where those dollars and those projects go. Uh, climate change, uh, we have, we're, you know, we're making progress um, uh, every day on addressing climate change in Nevada. One of the key bills that was passed in this last session um, is allowing the um, Division of Environmental Protection to have better, more granular uh, state-specific data um, to inventory our greenhouse gas emissions so we know um, what kind of progress we're making and, and where we need to do better. Um, so that's going to be very helpful. And then um, one small but important uh, uh, bill to address climate change and, and uh, air pollution in general was the closing of the classic car loophole that uh, Chair Watts um, sponsored. And um, we'll make sure that uh, vehicles who have a classic car registration are, uh, those cars are truly um, classic cars that are not driven uh, on a daily basis as commuter cars that um, pollute and are used for um, uh, going more than 5,000 miles in a single year. Um, <clears throat> sustainable recreation and tourism is a, is a big economic opportunity for Nevada and ties into many of the things I just talked about. Um, one program that we've got set up from the last session is the Dark Skies, Voluntary Dark Skies program. And that's also mentioned in your committee brief. Um, some of our other uh, highlights and successes um, that aren't directly related to legislation passed uh, uh, in previous sessions uh, are here on this, on this sheet. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, one significant regulatory mechanism that we were able to get across the finish line uh, recently was uh, Nevada becoming a, a clean car state, which is uh, uh, basically set up regulations so that there's more availability of low and zero emission vehicles available to Nevada consumers. Um, we became the 14th and then subsequently there's been a 15th state that have adopted these standards um, and it will help us keep on the leading edge of addressing uh, climate pollution from transportation, which is the largest source of greenhouse gas pollution in Nevada. Pollution in Nevada. Um, continuing to implement the Volkswagen settlement um, uh, uh, money to uh, limit pollution from uh, uh, diesel vehicles specifically and DERA grants, which is an EPA program 
called the Diesel Emissions Reduction uh, Program. We're using these programs to do everything from um, electric school buses to electrifying ground equipment at, um, uh, uh, sorry, Harry Reid International Airport uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, so that's been a very successful program that we continue to move forward on. Uh, <laughs> protecting Nevada's natural resources, something we do every day. We do it in close co uh, coordination with NDAL. Um, but one of the uh, two successes we've had recently is a, uh, a very good shared stewardship agreement with our federal partners to help guide uh, the investments that we're making on our landscapes to do so in a strategic and coordinated way. And then the um, partnership between the Nevada Division of Forestry and NV Energy to help uh, prevent wildfires in high risk areas. Uh, that has been uh, success for the most part and certainly with bringing new resources uh, to bear in critical fire areas. Uh, I mentioned previously the importance of responsible outdoor recreation. Uh, this is a focus for uh, everything, everything we're doing, uh, both in Lake Tahoe, such as the improvements that have been made at Spooner Lake State Park and along the East Shore Trail, um, uh, as, re as well as looking more broadly at, at recreation planning and infrastructure and tourism uh, statewide. Uh, again, our Division of Outdoor Recreation is getting up and running, um, and we will be uh, focusing on doing more of this and integrating it into all the work that we do going forward. Um, protecting the best water resources, this is an area that um, has some highlights and successes, but also very large challenges. We are in the process of uh, updating the state water plan. Uh, unfortunately, the state water plan is something that's not been updated since 1999, when uh, uh, when the, um, uh, the Bureau of uh, Water Planning was eliminated due to budget cuts. So this is integral to have back as part of our um, water conservation and planning efforts. Uh, as this dry state in the nation, I think this is just a, uh, an essential thing to have that we need to build on going forward. Um, and then also uh, uh, continuing to improve and work with our interagency partners on drought planning and response. You know, even when we get uh, one uh, good wet winter interspersed with others, it uh, doesn't mean we're necessarily out of a drought. And uh, in Nevada, particularly with the impacts of climate change, we need to be doing a constant efforts uh, to plan for and respond to um, drought. So that is a topic for the discussion, um, I hope, during the um, this committee subcommittee on public lands. As I mentioned before, some of our, our challenges and opportunities is more work needs to be done if we're gonna meet our greenhouse gas reduction targets uh, that we've set for Nevada, uh, more on, on water planning and drought response. Wildfire is gonna to continue to be a huge and ever-present issue. Um, the, uh, with the clean energy economy uh, surging forward, Nevada has a unique opportunity to play a role in uh, in providing the critical minerals, particularly lithium needed for EV batteries. And uh, I'm a firm believer that we can do sustainable um, uh, mining for lithium that can then be uh, mitigated through uh, healthy recycling um, of EV batteries of which many companies in are setting up shop in Nevada. Um, and uh, if you look at it as a circular economy, we've got lithium extraction, we've got EV battery manufacturing, we've got EV um, uh, battery recycling in the state. And that is something that is unique to Nevada that not many other places can claim to have all three elements of that clean energy circular economy. Uh, we're continuing to work to um, secure ARPA funds uh, as, a, as appropriate for our agency needs. We had significant budget cuts from the last session and we're looking to repair those um, and not just back to baseline, but also to move forward so we can meet the uh, these emerging challenges and opportunities and the needs of our constituents. Um, that will be uh, complemented through additional funding through the federal infrastructure bill that I've mentioned before and um, any other federal new federal money that comes our way. Uh, we are gonna be uh, aggressively seeking all formula and competitive money that's available and applicable to the department. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the 
conserve Nevada program, and then I'm going to talk about sage grouse, and I'll wrap it up. And if uh, you need me to go faster, uh, Chair, just uh, let in, in, interrupt and let me know. The uh, conserve Nevada uh, program is the new brand name for what others have uh, referred to in the past as the Q1 program or the Nevada Conservation Bond program. Uh, the uh, the original Q1 uh, conservation bond program was approved by voters in 2001, was very successful, um, uh, put a whole lot of projects on the ground, and we were able to reauthorize that with an additional $200 uh, million in bond authorization uh, during the 19, 2019 legislature, and then rolled $17.5 million that was remaining from the previous program into the new program. Um, and that... Um, getting that program up and running uh, has been a priority for the department of which we've made significant progress, um, including hiring a uh, program manager who uh, will uh, oversee the direct grants of that under that program as uh, articulated in the legislation and also set up um, the competitive, the regulations governing the competitive grant process. Uh, so other, uh, you know, any eligible entity can compete for those funds. You'll see here just some quick stats on the success of the of the of the prior quote unquote Q1 program that we are continuing as Conserve Nevada. Um, uh, you know, hundreds of projects uh, all across the state in every county, and uh, we look to build on that and are in the process of developing an interactive map where you can see what all these projects are um, by easily going to them. But we'll have that rolled out soon, hopefully. Uh, moving forward uh, with Conserve Nevada for the current biennium, uh, we were approved for 20 million in bond sales, um, uh, 15 million of which uh, was uh, was was targeted for the first year of the biennium, and 5 million for the second. The first tranche of 15 million, those bonds were sold, and we are in the process of making um, the direct allocations. Um, as you can see below, um, it lists all the direct allocations uh, that will. Uh, result from the uh, that 15 million being sold in December, and then um, we are on the cusp of finalizing regulations to have the competitive grant program up and running here in the near term as well. Um, to help guide that competitive grant program and make uh, uh, stakeholders and interest parties aware of the program, we're going to be holding um, multiple stakeholders here in the near term um, to, to solicit input. Um, and, and provide information on the program. And uh, we, uh, when, when, when we announce those, um, uh, those stakeholder meetings, um, we will share those with you so you can make sure that they get to your constituents directly um, from you as well, if you'd like. Our Sagebrush Ecosystem Program, this is um, the program that manages our, 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 our Sage Grouse Program in, in Nevada. Um, it has been a, very successful program in um, helping mitigate um, uh, human disturbances uh, on our land. So from uh, things like mining activity or other things that happen um, in sage grouse habitat, um, this program helps offset uh, those disturbances by protecting other uh, key, key sage grouse habitats. Um, and it has been um, very successful in the sense of getting um, credits developed, projects done, holding together uh, a Sagebrush Ecosystem Council that has a diverse um, representation on it from all impacted entities um, and has been ably chaired by um, JJ Goikachia uh, for some time now and has been very unique in Nevada in our, in, in, compared to others, not necessarily compared to, but in the context of what other states have done on the sage, uh, with their sage grouse uh, uh, programs or efforts. Um, our, uh, our council and our um, conservation credit system are unique in how they operate and how well they hold together uh, the diverse set of stakeholders uh, that care about our um, managing our sagebrush uh, ecosystem, which is about two thirds of the state of Nevada. You'll see here, um, and I'm sure Director Wazi will, will um, uh, double down on, on a lot of this here, is our party habitat, general habitat, and other habitat for sage grouse. Um, as I mentioned previously, it's about two thirds of our state. And the way I like to have people think about this map is if 
we fail in our efforts to protect the sagebrush habitat and the sage grouse and the species needs to be listed, you're looking at all of those colored areas uh, as having uh, significant restrictions on what can happen there. And um, that's gonna be a major issue uh, for our uh, economic well-being in Nevada. So the better we can uh, manage our habitat and our wildlife here in Nevada um, and uh, avoid, have a healthy sage grouse population um, and avoid listing, the better off we all are going to be. Uh, I will say that some of it is out of our control. Um, even the best system for managing human disturbances uh, is not able to outpace many of the other impacts that are happening right now, such as wildfire and invasive species, um, uh, predators, um, uh, the impact of uh, too many wild horse and burrows on uh, that is sustainable for the land, overgrazing, uh, I throw drought in there as well. So uh, we will continue to do everything we can um, through the Sage Grouse program to mitigate human disturbances. But the more we're able to do um, uh, on wildfire mitigation and managing invasive species, which is includes, but it goes above and beyond uh, just our Sage Grouse focus, uh, the better off we're going to be. So those uh, um, focusing on those things is gonna be critically important in the years ahead. Um, a bit of background on the conservation credit system that you can um, read at your leisure, but basically this is a market-driven system based on scientifically established credits. And what drives this, um, this tool is the science. And it's been, uh, while it is complicated, it's been very well received by those who um, use it, either uh, those who are uh, purchasing credits to offset disturbances or those uh, who are like ranchers who are creating credits um, to protect habitat that are made available to um, other entities who have a planned disturbance or permitted disturbance. Um, a little bit of background on our uh, projects right now, we've got more than 20 credit projects that have been done um, with um, 32,000 credits, uh, conserving quite a few, um, uh, 65,000 acres. We're going to continue. That's uh, that that the uh, curve is continuing to bend up at a uh, rapid pace, and we're going to continue to press on that. Uh, moving forward, we do have some challenges. The um, it's you know every federal administration that's 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 come through, uh, starting with the Obama administration, the Trump administration, now the Biden administration, has had a little bit of a different. Uh, 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 focus on how to manage the sage grouse issue in the West. And we are trying to be good partners in that effort and preserve what is uh, working successfully in Nevada um, and guard against any uh, uh, efforts from the federal government that would undermine uh, the su successes we had and instead focusing on the things that are gonna help um, enhance our efforts to date. Um, and that's gonna be an ongoing uh, dialogue with the, our federal partners, primarily the BLM and the um, U.S. Forest Service. With that, um, I hope it was helpful. If not too fast or quick an overview, I'm happy to answer questions now um, or after Director Wasley's uh, presentation. Uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to present to the committee. Thank you very much for the presentation, Director Kroll. I think you um, were just right in terms of pace and, and information included. Um, one thing I just want to note before we open it up um, to members for questions is that, um, as the director mentioned, there are many divisions, programs, and activities within the department. Um, we'll be probably going into greater depth um, on uh, some of those issues and having presentations directly from uh, divisions within the department. Yeah. So um, I don't want that to... Um, to stifle any questions, but just want to provide that. Of course, for example, as we get a look into water issues, we're going to have the Division of Water Resources and DEP will be here at some point as well, um, certainly, and, and probably others as well. So um, uh, also saying that for the benefit of the director, there may be some things that we, we may follow up in greater depth on in future meetings. So 
Um, with that, I believe the first uh, hand raised that I saw was Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and I got a couple of questions. And uh, one is on page 13. I'm looking at some of the symbols on, on the map. It says questions, uh, highlight, program highlight. And the one that's in the green that looks like a house, I'm not sure what that represents. Sorry, I was on mute. Sorry, uh, some of them, Allison, this is the uh, slide that's uh, Q1 program highlights at the top. Is that correct? Yes. Great. Um, I, I know my deputy, Jim Lawrence, is on the line, and, and maybe he can chime in here quickly. He's very familiar with the program um, and explain what the legend is associated with um, those projects listed on that map. And then I have one other follow up afterwards, too, if I may, Chair Mr. Chairman. That's fine. Go ahead, Mr. Lawrence. Um, great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, for the record, Jim Lawrence, Deputy Director, Department of Conservation, Natural Resources, up to you, Chair Watson, through you to Assemblyman Ellison. Um, that is the, the one that said looks like a house. That's actually supposed to be kind of a tent to represent campground and recreational facility improvements. The Q1 program just like the Conserve Nevada program has call out specifically for our state park system. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other question I have is on page 17 and uh, I'm sure that uh, um, Mr. Corral can answer this, but you know, there's a lot of programs going up in the North uh, where the sage grouse habitat is and if you look, uh, there's ranchers, there's private industry, there's uh, private individuals uh, and tribal that's doing a lot of projects up in there for the habitat, the sage grouse to keep it from unlisted. And the federal government says it was not to be listed because uh, it was not a native species. But the thing of it is, is all the studies in all the work that's been done up there, and you said that you you wanted to list this sage the sage hen. No, we're trying to avoid a listing because of the impact that would have on on operations, exactly as you've described in uh, those parts of Nevada. Okay, so, thank you, and I, I just want to clarify that, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assemblyman. Uh, I believe next we have Assemblywoman Peters. Chair, um, I have a couple of questions, some of which are not directly related to what was presented, um, but I and maybe require a follow up um, and are more comment related at this point, but others are questions. So, my first one is the State Environmental Commission. It looks like they have a vacancy from the State Board of Health, and I think at this point it's really important to have somebody from the State Board of Health on that commission because of. What we're looking at um, health-wise in the wake of climate change and the environmental justice challenges that are coming before those regulatory bodies um, that uh, address specific environmental health uh, risk concerns. So I guess, I guess my question there is, is there a timeline for someone to be appointed to that position? And then Thank you. For, I'll answer really quickly for you. Thank you yeah. for the question. I'm um, someone Peters, uh, Brad Kroll for the record. So we have identified um, the, uh, uh, someone to fill that spot from um, DHHS and they, I believe where we're at now is that they will be able to attend the next um, uh, SEC meeting. So they'll be formally appointed at that at that time? Perfect. Right. Cool. I was actually, my next comment was going to be, we should maybe consider having somebody from public and behavioral health on that committee, uh, commission as well, but it sounds like DHHS has probably proposed that. Uh, yeah. so that I'll table that for asking them on. Um, and I'm forgetting I'm forgetting the name, but we'll get it to you. I'll 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 look it up and get it to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then my my last question for you, I have a follow up, Chair Watts, um, but it will be for after we have the presentation on from the Department of Wildlife as well, um, but for both departments, if I may. 
Um, but my last question for Mr. Crowell, Director Crowell, is um, is there a place where the public can go to see all of those conservation and recreation projects being implemented under the conservation bond program and what their status is? Uh, thank you for the question, Someone Peters. Um, yes, we have a, a beta site uh, now that's going to provide that opportunity. And uh, I may look to um, Deputy Director Lawrence to give a, a better update on where that stands in terms of ro public rollout. Um, Mr. Lawrence, if you're still available to give an update, um, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, for the record, Jim Lawrence, uh, Deputy Director, DCNR. So we're very close, as Director Kroll said. Um, we have a beta version. I have to give a lot of props to Brandon Bishop, our new program manager. He really dove in and started doing all of the research to map all of those projects that were implemented over the last 10 years. As you can imagine, it, it was quite the task. Um, so we've got it just about ready to roll out to the public. We just have to do the mundane things like do a final search for grammatical errors and typos and things like that. And then it's ready to launch. And we're quite excited about that. That's good to hear. Um, your, your map on the presentation was what got me to wonder if you had that available for the public, because I'm sure there are folks who would like to be involved in some of those projects who don't know they exist yet. So I'm looking forward to that resource being available. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Assemblywoman Hansen. Sorry, it takes me so long to <laughs> unmute myself. Uh, good to see you, uh, Mr. Crowell. Um, I have a few questions in the comment um, on the Sage Hen uh, map. I noticed, you know, there were some hot spots, but the map was 2015 and and to kind of go off of what Assemblyman Ellison said, there, there have been some very uh, encouraging uh, uh, efforts made in some of those areas. So I was just curious, do we have a more current map than the one that was in the presentation of 2015? Again, look to Director Lawrence to answer why we're using the 2015 map, um, but it's probably not gonna look too different in terms of the scope of uh, of, the, of the issue, but uh, Director Lawrence, if you would like to, Deputy Director Lawrence, we'd like to answer that more specifically. Absolutely, thank you. Again, for the record, Jim Lawrence, Deputy Director, DCNR. So that is the two, two 2015 map that was adopted by um, our Sagebrush Ecosystem Council, put into the state plan, and then was adopted in the federal plans as well. Um, it is the one that is being used by the federal agencies because that's the one that's sort of the, the legally fresh one, so to speak. Um, but with that being said, we do update that map on a regular three to five year basis because we do believe that is extremely critical that, um, that we account for changes in the landscape. So built into our state plan is a three to five year adaptive management cycle where we work with um, Department of Wildlife as well as contract work with USGS. Um, and then we update the map based on, on conditions. I, you know, I, I know the part of Northeastern Nevada that um, has been referenced and I, I totally agree. There's been wonderful work that's been done up there and um, the map might not change. It still will probably be priority habitat because it is still great habitat um, for, for the bird. The question then becomes in the land use plans, what does that mean? And so we've built our conservation credit system to basically not be um, a hard regulatory stick, but to have that encouragement to do the good landowner work such as being done in Northeastern Nevada. Thank you for that. Um, and, and also, well, and you know, we won't go into the sage grouse too much, but as part of studying and the data, which hopefully as we go forward, you know, that we do take it being on the ground. I'm up in that area a lot and, and boy, I'm seeing sage grouse a lot. So that's why the map to me kind of stood, stood out as maybe being, you, you guys are saying it's not really going to change much, but boy, when you're on the ground up there um, and even some parts of central Nevada, you know, I'm seeing sage grouse on a regular basis. Now, what are those numbers? I hope that we also reference historical data 
from when, you know, settlers, uh, uh, journals from some of, you know, those that came into Nevada, some of the first white men into Nevada, note explorers like Fremont, what historically, what was our baseline? Uh, so are we being realistic in what our numbers should be? That's always my question when we're talking wildlife, what are the historical numbers when we're getting concerned about what they are now? Um, another thing was, uh, uh, Director Crowell, a, a lot in your presentation uh, was made about climate. And I, I, we all love clean water. We all want clean air. We all care about our wildlife. But I do hope that as part of our um, time here on natural resources or even in public lands, we throw out climate an awful lot. It's, it certainly has legitimate concerns, but I do hope that we will, if we're going to make claims, whoever's making the claim about climate, and some of these are very sweeping, doomsday, almost-esque sorts of uh, narratives, I hope that we're going to spend time, if those things are going to be said, that we're going to back it up. Now, we say there's science, but we know there's science that set, argues it both ways. So um, I just, as we talked about the classic car loophole and that legislation from the last session, when we deal with this subject, we have to address hypocrisy as well. And I was very, if we're really serious about climate, when I spoke with lobbyists that represented Patagonia, Ikea, um, and Levi about the classic car bill, they have plants in China. So if we're going to go after Nevadans who have cars that are older than 25 years and throw out some smog, we're, we're not getting to the problem. We've got to, if we are really concerned about climate, then we better address it. And even though we're a state of 50, we better address it that it's a global issue. And the United States is a good player. And so if, and I'm on board, let's go after the, the, the pollution that's happening in China and how they don't have to play by the same rules that we do, but we let those manufacturers bring their products here. And their products have been the result of very bad environmental injustices in China that pollute the whole world. So I, I just need to put that on the record. Um, and, and as we talk about water and climate, I hope we address this as well. Where is ancient Lake Lahontan? 12,000 years ago, there wasn't a carbon footprint. There wasn't a car on, in Nevada or, and it bordered three, it was in three states, 900 feet deep, covered 8,500 square miles. So as we talk about climate and we do need to be responsible for what we do as citizens now, but we also have to recognize that climate change is cyclical. There have been droughts, there have been ice ages. And so I hope we talk about all of that as we talk about living in the most arid state in the nation. That This is no surprise. Nevada is the most arid state in the nation. And with it comes some unique problems that we're going to address. So sorry, that was more a lot of statement, but I think since we have opened up natural resources interim meeting with a lot of talk about climate, a lot of environmental injustices. I just feel we need to look at the whole picture. So thank you for the opportunity, Chair, and thank you, um, Director Krell, for being here. Director, would you like to respond to that? Sure, and, and I'll be brief. Um, uh, Senator Wynne Hampson, it's good to see you again. Um, uh, I appreciate your, your, your comments and sentiments. Let me start with Sage Grouse. Um, and, in terms of, of, of specific population numbers, um, I'm certain that uh, Director Wasley um, can del there's plenty to delve in and can delve into that more, but let me put one thing in context for you on that. So our conservation credit system, which helps offset disturbances from, from like new mining activity, we've helped protect 65,000 uh, acres of high quality sage grouse habitat that uses that program. It's been a great success, but when we have a fire that burns 500,000 acres, even up to a million acres, 
uh, and, and that is inclusive of sage grouse habitat, that's what we're up against. And even the best system to offset disturbances from new mining activity are being dwarfed by things like fire and drought, invasives, predators, et cetera. Um, and that's what we need to keep in context about what's within our control and not within our control. And um, this is for the well-being of Nevada, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the decades, decades ahead uh, is, you know, we got to come up with Nevada centered solutions um, um, for this problem so that we don't get uh, a heavy handed one um, from the federal government on climate change. You know, I, 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 I you know, I, I take your comments seriously. At the same time, I'll tell you. We can only control what we can control here in, in Nevada uh, within our own jurisdiction. And in that context, it, it's I'm very focused on uh, identifying and promoting um, climate solutions that are going to work for Nevada, um, not ones that are uh, more suited to the Northeast and a more urbanized area, et cetera. Um, we need to find ways to manage our, the health and well-being of our natural resources here that works best for us. You know, we've got more federal land here in the state in Nevada than anywhere else, um, lots of open space. And so whether you want to associate with climate or not, wildfires are becoming more intense, droughts are becoming longer, et cetera. If we're not managing for those things uh, while also um, limiting the increase of pollution, then we're not doing our part for Nevada or for our country. So I hope to work with you on Nevada specific solutions going forward. Thank you for that, Director. Um, you know, I just say another thing, which is that you know I appreciate that the department is providing an overview of of um, all of the legislation that affects it, um, and some of that legislation um, uh, is, is more under the purview of Growth and Infrastructure Committee. And and as I noted in my introductory remarks, you know, a lot of the the work on addressing emissions from energy production, transportation, et cetera, tends to be focused on that side. Um, you know, what I will say, though, is that um, there, there may be uh, debates around some of the modeling and, um, you know, it, it's you can never attribute a specific wildfire, uh, a specific drought or a specific level of intensity directly to our changing climate. But the science is practically universal that um, there is a greenhouse effect, that there are certain chemicals that cause it and that human activity is releasing those chemicals. And um, yes, we do have uh, uh, climate cycles, um, but we are, um, we are influencing those cycles. And I don't wanna debate um, ice ages um, and the, the level of Lake Lahontan while um, Rye Patch and Lake Mead um, are drying up and putting people's livelihoods at risk. Um, so that's, that's where I'm coming from, but you know, our, our focus is uh, not on the issue of uh, how Nevada and the nation can lead by example um, in addressing what is indeed a global problem with, uh, with emissions. Um, our focus in this committee is the fact that, um, again, for people who live on the landscape, we're seeing those impacts and there is uh, no sign that they're going to, to let up um, anytime soon, and we need to prepare for how our ranching, our agriculture, um, our, our water use, um, our wildlife um, are going to adapt if uh, some of these trends continue or uh, generally get worse as some of the, the modeling uh, has tended to show. Uh, Senator Goykachia, I believe uh, you had your hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Am I unmuted? You are, please proceed. Okay, we'll see if I can get there. Uh, Mr. Crowell, uh, Brad, uh, you you have 16 boards and commissions under you, and I get a lot of questions from time to time from these boards and commissions on how they replace their members. I, I would like to ask you if you could, uh, you or Jim, uh, get kind of do a, whether they're statutorily, are they supposed to be reappointed by say the conservation district, do they nominate the members and then they are appointed by the governor? Could you kind of put a put a list together how these these members are appointed uh, for a future meeting? I, that seems to be one of the big questions, like uh, just following along the lines with uh, Assemblywoman Peters, you know, there's a vacancy. All right, how's it filled? Yeah. Uh, that's uh, an ongoing question. Senator thank, you, Senator Gorsuch, thank, you for, thank you for the question. Uh, so 
each of those 16 boards and commissions uh, are going to likely have different criteria for who, who could be appointed, what their skill set is, what the term of the appointment is, whether it's an advisory body, a regulatory body, et cetera. Um, and some of them are much more active and, and quote unquote important than others. Um, I would be happy to have uh, DCNR staff put together a list uh, for each of those boards and commissions about what um, the parameters are for um, uh, the membership and um, highlight any vacancies, particularly any long-term vacancies. Um, quite honestly, it'd be probably a helpful exercise for us to do as well. And um, we're happy to, to do that and provide it for the committee for future um, reference and discussion. Thank you, Mr. Crowell. It'd make my life a whole lot easier. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? Uh, seeing none, then, uh, Director Crawl, I just had one more thing that I'd like to ask, and you did mention this at, at a few different points in your presentation around uh, some of the, the federal funds. Of course, there's been some flexible funds around uh, the American Rescue Plan that um, there is quite a bit of interest around. I want to actually focus a little bit more on the Infrastructure um, Act that's been passed and the various pools of funding. Um, I, I don't expect you to uh, discuss every pool that that exists right now, but you know, as you noted, there's both um, competitive grants and formula funding um, available for different um, types of projects. And um, I was just wondering if you know there's anything that you can provide, I, I suppose, at a, a high level uh, around that, and particularly when it comes to um, uh, you know, projects that have a, a matching requirement um, and, and just how you're, how you're starting to think about that. Uh, of course, the, the state infrastructure bank has kind of uh, preliminarily carved out a pool of funds to help pull down um, some of those uh, um, matching dollars. But, um, you know, I was just wondering if you could kind of, again, in, in, in broad strokes, um, speak about what what kind of things look like and, and how you feel about being able to pull down the often small amount of matching dollars um, at the state level in order to harness um, uh, everything that would be available from, from the feds. Um, thank you, Chair Watts. I appreciate the question. Um, it's a very timely one and I, I'm not gonna have a perfect answer for you because uh, this is very much still in motion. I actually am testifying to you today from Washington, D.C., where I met with um, high-level folks from uh, the Department of Interior and the Department of Ag uh, yesterday to talk about this very subject and how we are going to coordinate um, our efforts to make sure that there's efficacy between uh, what the feds are doing and how the states are implementing those dollars. I will say for Nevada, um, particularly in the jurisdictional space of DCNR, uh, the gr greatest uh, opportunities are gonna be within the competitive grant dollars that the infrastructure bill set out. Um, there is still uh, efforts underway by the federal agencies themselves to sort out what was in the legislation um, in terms of plussing up uh, existing programs, but that may have a little bit different or more lenient rules, uh, establishing new competitive grant programs. And so we are following that closely so that we, when it's, finalized, we know what money is available, how to available, avail ourselves of it. Um, and uh, the match will be an issue both for state, the state, as well as for um, uh, other eligible entities, you know, nonprofits and things like that, other stakeholders. And uh, I've heard a lot from people about their concern about being able to uh, find a match to, to use these funds. And uh, my hope is that the infrastructure bank can, in Nevada can provide some of that assistance, but I think that when we have a, a full picture of what's available and what Nevada's needs are, we're gonna have to find some other solutions to make sure we can bring that money in um, by uh, identified uh, matching funds. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that's exactly kind of what I was hoping for. So we look forward to continuing to get uh, updates um, as, as you and others in the state gather them. I think being able to get 
a picture of what uh, that is will be important. And uh, I, I encourage all members to think about uh, how we can um, see some of those opportunities. In, you know, in some cases, excess of 90% of a project can be funded by the federal government, but um, we're going to need to be able to put something up in order to make those projects happen while fulfilling our uh, all of our existing responsibilities as a state. So, uh, Senator Donyate, uh, Vice Chair Donyate, I believe you have- May Chair Watts, just oh. really quickly, at a, future, at, a, at a future meeting, we could probably come and give a quick brief on, um, on those opportunities. Um, they should be uh, much more readily available and understandable by then. So we're happy to do that if it's helpful. Wonderful, thank you. And of course, um, you know, it'd be something of interest to uh, uh, the Finance Committee as well moving forward. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Donyate, I believe you had a question. Thank you so much, Chair Watts. Really quickly, Director Quall, and thank you so much for the presentation. Um, can you provide any feedback or updates on uh, what happened after the passage of SAR 10? That was the one to protect uh, Sunrise Mountain last session. Has there been any movement on that from the federal side and the conversations you've had um, to protecting that or making any movements on it? I just wanted to see if you can provide the committee any updates on it. Uh, I thank you for the, queer, uh, the question, Vice Chair John Hunter. Um I am not familiar with that one. It's not on our list of uh, legislation that the department has a role in, but uh, maybe we missed something and I can quickly go back and look at it. If Deputy Director Lawrence, if that's familiar to you or even Director Wasley, please um, feel free to go forward. I may be, maybe you're using a different term and I'm just uh, misremembering. Uh, my, I, I guess I was just asking, like, uh, with your conversations with the federal representatives, if that has come up um, in terms of like what we could use ARP funding for, or if there were anything, if there was any movement beyond the bill when we passed the resolution, like that was pretty much my, my question, my inquiry. Yeah, I think just just to clarify that, um, Director. So you know, there was a resolution passed in in um, encouraging. Uh, the greater protection and kind of recognition of uh, Sunrise Mountain Rainbow Gardens as I believe as a national monument. And so I think the question was just, has there been any uh, additional um, uh, movement or discussion on that um, since the since the session? I'm with you, thank you, I, I apologize. Um, uh, so the latest I've heard on this, and this is uh, again, not directly at this point within the scope of the department, but um, uh, Congresswoman Titus is advancing federal legislation to establish that national monument. Um, uh, Representative Lee has expressed her support for it as well. Um, and, you know, the way I'm looking and thinking about it um, from one perspective is uh, if that monument is established, um, how does that change the formula for things like the America the Beautiful goal of uh, protecting 30% of our lands and waters uh, by 2030? Um, if that monument is established in Nevada, that could go a long way to helping uh, meet that goal, depending on what the criteria set for it is. So um, it's, uh, it, it, it's a federal issue right now. Um, we are monitoring it. And if we are asked to be a cooperating agency in any way um, in evaluating or establishing it, um, as directed by uh, Congress, we're happy to do that. Um, but right now, we um, uh, there's not a direct role for the department. Thank you for that, Director. And and just to clarify for um, the benefit of all the members, that is the proposed Avikwa May uh, National Monument um, at the southern tip of the state. And um, it was mentioned in, I believe, Assembly Joint Resolution 3, um, which expressed the state's support for uh, conserving, uh, permanently conserving a uh, portion of our state's lands and waters. Uh, members, any other questions for the director or the department at this time? All right, seeing none, thank you very much uh, for the presentation, uh, Director Kroll, and we look forward to uh, continuing the conversation with you and um, your divisions over the course of the interim. Uh, with that, we will move on to our second presentation for uh, the day. Uh, we will have a presentation on uh, from our uh, State Department of Wildlife. Uh, Director Wasley, uh, you can introduce yourself and proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Watts. 
committee members. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Tony Wasley, director for Department of Wildlife. Uh, I, I just wanna say that we're very grateful for this opportunity that uh, when presented with the opportunity from, from our perspective, it's, it's not just yes, it's, it's, it's heck yeah. So uh, despite being the, the seventh largest state in the country, the, the state wildlife agency in Nevada is among the, the seven smallest, but although we're small, uh, lean, we're incredibly passionate, productive, and, and professional. What I'm, what I'm going to try to accomplish in this presentation um, is to try to go a mile wide and an inch deep on a whole lot of things. I will uh, descend a little bit on a few topics, but then uh, let you, Mr. Chair, and committee members determine which of those areas maybe you'd like a, a little deeper explanation on, and, and we, can, we can take a little deeper dive on those areas. But I'm going to start with a PowerPoint presentation. I'll have a short uh, video in the middle of that, and then we'll wrap up with the PowerPoint presentation and hopefully have some time for questions. Are you seeing the uh, PowerPoint in the presentation mode? We are. Full screen, excellent. So I will uh, just have four basic parts here and uh, with your guidance chair, we'll have a very brief uh, agency overview. We'll provide an update on recently passed legislation, talk a little bit about uh, wildlife status, uh, primarily through a, a video, and then talk about some, some challenges and, and opportunities. So just by way of agency overview, uh, kind of a refresher, the agency's mission, protect, conserve, manage, and restore wildlife and its habitat for the aesthetic, scientific, educational, recreational, and economic benefits to citizens of Nevada and the United States and to promote the safety of persons using vessels on the waters of Nevada. Under the director's office, we have seven unique divisions, data and technology services, conservation education, law enforcement, game division, fisheries division, wildlife diversity division, and the habitat division. Approximately 250 active employees, including nine commissioners, 120 buildings, 34 radio sites, uh, mountaintop repeaters, uh, 12 wildlife management areas consisting of 143,000 acres, eight major facilities, uh, regional offices and other offices, seven unique divisions, as I mentioned, four fish hatcheries administered across three administrative regions as the map to the left there depicts. I'll start with the update on, on recently passed legislation. Uh, we heard from uh, Director Kroll. I'm just gonna work through this slide uh, from left to right, uh, top row, middle row, bottom row. We heard from uh, Director Kroll on the, the conservation bond program, Conserve Nevada. Uh, the deadline to expend uh, that first uh, two and a half million for the Department of Wildlife is this calendar year. Um, the majority of which is directed towards uh, repairing the dam at, at, at Cave Lake. AB 307 and, and AB uh, 211 are cost recovery programs. AB 307 was passed back in the 2011 session. It pertains to uh, cost recovery related to renewable energy projects. Um, there are 147 active project applications at the present time of those 147 93 are solar, 39 transmission projects that include both uh, power and others such as natural gas pipelines, 13 geothermal projects, four wind projects, and 11 other projects such as hydropower or energy storage facilities. There are nine canceled or inactive project applications for amendments, but it's interesting that we received approximately 20% of our total number of applications to the program just in last year alone. We've seen a large increase in the number of applications for projects in Northern Nevada with the majority of those being solar or transmission line projects. The bulk of projects proposed still occur in Clark and Knight counties with 50% of all project applications located just in those two counties. 
AB 211 is the cost recovery uh, related to urban development. This passed in the 2021 session. It's a technical review like comment on certain housing developments. Uh, it's an urban development review program. And our staff have been meeting with industry representatives to discuss the new legislation in preparation for regulation development. And we will move forward with uh, the development of that regulation early this year. The predator fee program, which is the $3 fee that's assessed to each and every application uh, for a big game tag generates approximately $800,000 annually. Uh, there's a small uh, $14,000 fee that goes directly to the Department of Agriculture uh, to assist in their administration of predator control activities. Those predator projects, as we uh, refer to them, are included in a annual plan. There's also an annual report. Those uh, documents are approved by the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners, and those projects fall into three types of expenditures. One, management of predatory wildlife. Two, uh, research or studying of lethal control techniques, the efficacy of, of various methods, and three, uh, protection of of sensitive or priority species. Coyote contests. Uh, this has been in front of uh, both the legislature as well as, as the Wildlife Commission. Most recently, the Wildlife Commission was uh, presented with some draft language. Um, they held five meetings. It's, it's I think, a very important distinction. That these contests are not um, not surrounding predator removal or predator control, but simply um, dealing with the contest. The language that the commission considered most recently and held uh, five meetings on contained uh, some language that would limit entry fees, uh, promotion of contests, and uh, offering of prize money or rewards. Uh, the commission ultimately voted to take no action in a split vote. Uh, previous session back in 2017, uh, you all approved a license simplification program for the Department of Wildlife. At, at that time, uh, there was in excess of 25 different license types for people uh, wishing to, to hunt, fish, or trap. Uh, that was simplified to a, a much more streamlined structure uh, to uh, seven licenses. Also, what occurred at that same time is the department uh, secured a, a new license vendor. Uh, looking at the increased purchases as well as the cost savings and efficiencies uh, combined from the license simplification and uh, the new vendor, the first three years um, generated an additional $10 million uh, approximately for the Department of Wildlife. And as we look at the last four year growth uh, as a result of that simplification and in partnership with that new vendor, we've seen uh, nearly a 55% increase in hunting license sales and just over 55% increase in fishing license sales. Again, this over the last four year period and an increase of just over 5% in uh, boat registrations. 2019 session, um, you all provided authority to uh, the department to pursue the purchase of a building, a new office, um, a building, a new office, not building a new office in Las Vegas. Um, and we will um, share some additional materials um, for any of you that have a desire to, to learn a little bit more about that. I'll speak to that here in a second, but we've got a, I believe it's about a four minute a video tour of that facility um, that that's museum like uh, as an interpretive experience. Also from the 2019 session, uh, tribal engagement, uh, there was clear direction provided to executive branch agencies on that that tribal engagement. We we have a tribal liaison. Uh, I think one of the highlights uh, in terms of partnerships with tribes that the department uh, would highlight is that the Pyramid Lake the Paiute um, tribe bighorn sheep reintroduction and uh, we'll also uh, share a, a video of that event and and then the video that I'll show here shortly there's some highlights from that. I'm now moving down to the the bottom row of tag transfers. Uh, the, the most uh, recent couple past sessions there's been quite a bit of discussion about 
uh, eligibility opportunity for individuals to transfer tags, share tags, provide tags to, to, to non-profits. Uh, that authority uh, was created and provided to the commission to administer, uh, develop regulation and administer that program. Uh, didn't didn't turn out as a, as a originally intended. We're continuing to to work on that, um, working with the commission so that the tag transfer bill that was readdressed in 2021, um, after some recognized uh, language deficiencies that came out of the 2019 session, that authority has been clarified and, and renewed, and a regulation has been drafted, and that that regulation would allow an individual to transfer his or her tag to a qualified organization for use by a person who has a disability or life-threatening condition. And that'll be heard by the commission uh, in March for a workshop. The Falcon Rebill SB 125, uh, the department has been meeting with stakeholders um, and the department is in the process of, of drafting a regulation uh, that, that was simply um, creating the allowance for falconers to have golden eagles in their possession. In most instances, it would be uh, for rehab purposes and allowing the recovery of, of those individual animals before they'd be uh, released back out onto the landscape. Um, Endow's cleanup bill from 2021 was SB 406, and it contained, uh, it, it revised provisions governing the Wildlife Trust Fund and uh, authorized the tag to be in an electronic format. It also updated the requirement, uh, the residency requirement to be eligible for a senior uh, license, which is a, a reduced cost. The commission will hear the regulation on the e-tags, those electronic big game tags for the very first time next week at the commission meeting. And the department, uh, just, just uh, to add, the department has participated in every IFC meeting this year for donation approvals. We continue to get significant uh, donations from industry partners and, and NGOs towards our, our conservation efforts and, and activities. Uh, the last item is urban wildlife. This is a, an item that the agency has come before you multiple occasions and uh, looking for assistance, uh, capacity, uh, general fund contribution toward the urban wildlife challenge. Uh, we've been able to create positions, create programs, uh, educational programs, outreach efforts. And just last year, the calendar year last year, the agency received in excess of 1,000 calls just dealing with bears uh, and numbers that exceeded that for each uh, coyotes and, and birds. So that, that has been put to great use and is of great value. So thank you for that. Wanted to highlight uh, a couple recent acquisitions. One is a transfer of the Carson Lake and Pasture. It's been 30 years in the making. The Bureau of Reclamation uh, finally completed that transfer this, this past year. Um, the agency is, is working with partners, Truckee Carson Ir Irrigation District, as well as the Greenhead uh, Duck Club to ensure that, that their use of those areas um, is minimally disrupted and in concert uh, with their wishes and desires. Uh, we're also developing a, a management plan uh, at, the, at the present time. Also, um, the Licking Ranch, uh, this is a, a property just north of Battle Mountain. Um, having this in state ownership is consistent with the wishes of, of the current owner, uh, supported by Lander County, uh, supported by the grazing permittee who uses that, that land for, for their operation. Um, it's got a, a broad support. I also wanted to point out NRS uh, 361055, which requires the State Department of Wildlife to continue to uh, pay taxes. The, our agency is, doesn't, doesn't have the same exemption. So oftentimes uh, one of the, the counters to public ownership is the lack of tax revenue. And I, I just wanted to point out that the Department of Wildlife continues to pay taxes on, on any lands administered by the department in, in state ownership. So now I'd like to try to see if I can segue to this, this video. Um, so bear with me. It, it has uh, music, but I'll, I'm going to probably mute that and uh, provide just a, a brief narration. 
as I do that. So this, uh, can you see that okay? Not yet. It looks like we're still seeing the PowerPoint presentation. You might need to stop sharing and then reshare. Uh, I'll defer to broadcast to help out here. Hi, Mr. Wasley, are you able to hear me? This is Cindy with broadcast. Yes, I can. Yeah, just go ahead and try sharing again. And then uh, I remember you had, when we tested it out, you showed it to me in a different link. We can go ahead and do that if you'd like. Take a look at this. There we go. Okay, uh, this is uh, also something that we will share uh, with the committee members. Um, and as indicated, there there isn't a uh, a voiceover uh, narration. There's just uh, music. But I will I'll speak to some of the the sites uh, in this and try to provide some explanations as as we go through this. So this will will highlight um, division by division, um, just some some key projects as, as, and some updates. Just a quick overview. We'll start with the the game division. Uh, we continue to. Uh, do a, a significant amount of, of capture work. We're trying to understand disease transmission and occurrence in our bighorn sheep population, as well as their habitat usage. We're also uh, using GPS collar technology on mule deer to better understand habitat connectivity, corridor use, animal, animal condition. We also uh, have Collars now on moose in Nevada, and we're also uh, monitoring elk. The overwhelming majority of, of that collar work is to understand habitat use, corridors, uh, and wildlife health. This is some highlights from the, the bighorn sheep release in the Pyramid Lake uh, tribal, ancestral tribal lands. Sheep had been extirpated from those lands uh, for, for decades. So some of our uh, mule deer capture work it allows us to assess body condition to determine the health of those animals, which is the, the single best indicator of the health of the habitat, as well as, as any potential uh, pathogen issues or, or disease issues that, that these animals uh, could be experiencing. Most of this work is accomplished in coordination uh, with, in, in partnership with a number of uh, NGOs. Uh, they, they purchase uh, collars, which are in the neighborhood of three to three to five thousand uh, dollars for GPS collar technology and, and data downloads. Uh, they provide assistance on on site with the handling of animals, capturing animals, releasing animals. Um, we're able to use their time and, and financial contribution as, as match to garner uh, federal funds. This is uh, demonstrating the benefits of some of the wildlife overpasses that were built in northeastern Nevada, some on Highway 93 north of Wells, on I-80 through partnership with the Department of Transportation. Uh, really appreciate um, our relationship with NDOT, their willingness to um, provide you know, significant engineering, financial assistance and partnership in the placement of this is an underpass. These animals take two to three years to really learn uh, how, to, how to use those facilities. Next, uh, just some highlights from our, our fisheries division. So this is uh, some drone footage of Cave Lake. Uh, as indicated, we're doing some repair work on the dam. This is uh, 
a, a fish salvage operation rather than just draw that down and, and let those uh, fish suffer. Uh, agency went in and, and conducted a capture, removed those fish from Cave Lake, uh, placed them in a, a truck uh, and hauled them the short distance down to Cummins Lake. So just uh, a little trivial uh, fact, Cave Lake does have the state record for, for brown trout. And although we didn't see any new state records, we certainly saw some beautiful fish like this brown trout um, that is now presumably still swimming around in uh, Cummins Lake. This is rye patch, a unique, unique fishery in the northwest part of the state. Uh, one of the few areas in the state where we have a, a walleye fishery. Uh, the agency uh, is able to purchase large volumes of walleye fry, which are hardly visible here. Uh, those are released in, into this reservoir and uh, many of which grow to adulthood and, and provide a uh, recreational fishery in, in this body of water. So I, I heard uh, Director Kroll say that you know Nevada is the driest state uh, in the country, and we're we're frequently uh, reminded of that. And and the uh, fisheries arena um, probably more sensitive to it than than many others with the ebbs and flows of, of waters. This is in desert desert shores down in Las Vegas, which operates as a safe harbor uh, for recovery efforts of a listed species. This is Third Creek in Incline, where we're capturing uh, naturalized uh, trout from the lake, uh, milking those fish for, for eggs and seeming to be used to um, populate our hatcheries with, uh, with those eggs for rearing. The agency raises and releases approximately a, a million fish a year that that then at, at the end uh, provide again that that recreational uh, opportunity. Not clearly not all the uh, efforts and contributions in the fisheries arena are are for uh, recreational aspirations. I, I would say the overwhelming uh, majority are recovery efforts and and habitat maintenance. The wildlife diversity division. This is a uh, bald eagle that was blown, uh, eaglet, it's only a couple months old, it was blown out of a nest early in the pandemic and our staff specialist, wildlife diversity, Joe Barnes, um, has some climbing experience and was able to return that bird to its nest. Unfortunately, uh, one of the nest mates uh, didn't survive, but that one did. A couple uh, great horned owls that were at DRI, many of you may, may have seen either in social media or, or the, uh, the news. This is Hobart, Hobart Lake. Our law enforcement division, our game wardens, our category one peace officers uh, with broad jurisdictional authority uh, from, from the waterways uh, to, to the mountains, uh, essentially, um, as, I, as I like to say, kind of the, the highway patrol of, of the waterways and, and the back roads. One of the one of the things that that's clearly uh, under our, our mission and our our statutory charge is the operation safe operation of vessels and public safety on on water. Um, you know, growing growing challenges. Uh, more and more more and more people on on the water. More personal watercraft um, conduct a significant uh, number of, of rescues as well. This is highlighting uh, Warden Sean Flynn, who received the Silver Life Saving Medal from the U.S. Coast Guard. That was a U.S. Coast Guard Admiral providing that medal. That's a medal that has been given out fewer times than the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, Game Warden Flynn uh, saved, saved the life of a, of a young girl trapped in an overturned boat at Lake Mead. 
Conservation Education Division, as the name implies, uh, a lot of education uh, interacts significantly uh, with, with youth. Uh, this is a, a free fishing day, kids free fishing day. Uh, love to see those, those smiles and, and the engagement uh, with, with our state's youth. It's a fishing, a fishing clinic, uh, obviously uh, indoors. Con Ed also has our uh, urban wildlife, most of the urban wildlife responsibilities, public education. Uh, we do a lot of uh, fly tying uh, classes and trout in the classroom where kids follow the development of fish from, from egg to releasable fish and they take those fish out and, and release them. Uh, great educational opportunity and helps to foster a sense of stewardship for Nevada's wildlife resources. This is some uh, footage of the Mason T. Ortiz outdoor camp that is conducted in partnership um, with our NGO community. The data and technology services um, has had some interesting challenges, COVID related challenges, trying to meet the needs of, of customers, maintain essential business functions, keep offices open, continue to to register vessels, uh, provide assistance to individuals uh, who, who may not have computer access at home or simply may need uh, assistance in transferring vessels. I, I previously referenced our law enforcement as kind of the highway patrol of the water. Uh, our licensed staff is kind of the, the DMV of, um, equivalent as it pertains to boats. Habitat division, as, as the name suggests, uh, a, lot of, a lot of focus on uh, critical habitat needs, um, mule deer, sagebrush. I, I will uh, take advantage of the opportunity to do a little bit deeper dive on some of the sagebrush, sage grouse uh, issues. But we do a tremendous amount of seeding. This is a drill seeding post fire, trying to get some uh, native components back in there, trying to retain the soil, trying to get some, some forage in there for a whole host of species, whether it's kangaroo rats or mule deer or pronghorn antelope, everything that we have, all 895 species under our jurisdictional authority uh, need, need some habitat, uh, whether it be shelter or, or, or food. This is a uh, aerial seeding operation uh, conducted with a fixed wing aircraft that's loading up the seed in, into the hopper. Uh, this aircraft will fly over the, the burned area with some unique uh, mechanical machinery that's uh, fixed under the wing and it'll distribute that seed. If you uh, watch, watch that device right there as, as this aircraft is over the, the fire, you'll begin to see uh, the dis distribution of that seed. This is part of the reason that uh, legislatively, uh, you know, creating opportunity for the department to accept uh, donations in emergency situations was was so critical. This is the other part of that with with the unprecedented drought and challenges trying to to get water to wildlife uh, became uh, particularly challenging in, in in the south as as the chair mentioned. Uh, the absence of some of that monsoonal moisture really exacerbated this problem. The agency uh, has over seventeen hundred. Uh, water developments to provide water to, to wildlife. Uh, th those devices are filled by rainwater. So when the rain doesn't come, those animals uh, have, have some significant challenges meeting their hydration needs. And uh, we've had to be creative and learn quite a bit, again, through partnership with our NGO community. Uh, we use these uh, orange pumpkins. This is a, a state-owned aircraft. Uh, we use these orange pumpkins, uh, use a staging area with the pool where you just saw this aircraft dip that. It's placed into uh, another portable holding area that you can't drive to. And then you can see the pump and the blue hose there. And so that water will be pumped into those large brown tanks that were on the left side to hold that water to be, so it'll be made available. So that, um, Concludes just that quick overview uh, of several key projects that have a direct nexus to, to some of the, the items that, that you have uh, assisted with. 
I'm going to stop sharing, cue that PowerPoint back up and try to segue back to that. Are you able to see the PowerPoint now? We are. Excellent. So I want to highlight uh, a few of the challenges. Um, and some of those challenges were already um, spoke, spoken to earlier in uh, Director Kroll's presentation. They were demonstrated through some of that video. Um, but they, they aren't independent of one another. So we talk about wildfire and invasives, climate change, wild horses and burrows. And we could talk about any one of those challenges, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is they're, they're all interrelated. Um, most uh, of you are, are intimately aware of the, the challenge of cheatgrass and what it does to the fire cycle. Uh, we see fires that are burning more frequently. We see fires that are larger in size uh, and, and encroaching into a, a shrinking um, remnant of, of sagebrush. Um, and as the climate warms or as we experience drought, uh, whether temporary or permanent or short term or long term, it exacerbates that wildfire and invasive species relationship. Another item that uh, exacerbates that is the presence of, of wild horses and, and burrows. Um, Nevada's current wild horse and burrow population is estimated to be 53,741, which is 375% above appropriate management level. We're documenting uh, significant impacts to habitat, soil, uh, competition, and are looking for you know, partnership and opportunity to, to bring uh, solutions to it. But it, it is unprecedented and it's exacerbated by drought and it isn't uh, unrelated to, to wildfire and invasive species. We have fires that, that burned 23 years ago back, back in the 1990s that have millions of dollars invested in rehab. Uh, that success is now being jeopardized due to the, the horse use and the numbers of horses in, in those uh, reseeding efforts. I would like to kind of point out that fun fact in the lower left-hand corner of the screen that Endow and over 15 conservation partners have been able to sex successfully rehabilitate 475,000 acres of wildfire impacted habitat in Nevada uh, just between 2017 and 2021 while contributing approximately $9.873 million. This equates to an area of over 742 square miles or larger than Douglas County at, at 738 square miles. So opportunities ahead. Sage grouse conservation. Uh, we talked a lot about sage grouse during Director Kroll's presentation. Um, currently, the, the Bureau of Land Management has begun a uh, land use plan um, effort to revisit some of the past land use planning efforts to determine where, where we're headed. Uh, since 1998, Endow has funded over $33 million on rehabilitation and restoration of sagebrush habitats. Endow maintains a sage grouse lek database. A lek is uh, simply uh, the area where the, the males go to strut, dance, and the females come to, to pick out uh, their lucky mate. Uh, Endow maintains a lek database with just under 2,000 leks in, in Nevada. And there's been uh, over 36,000 surveys of those leks dating back uh, to 1950. We spent two and a half million in sage grouse research projects over the last five years to determine effects of wildfire, effects of transmission lines, treatment effectiveness, uh, that's habitat, uh, manipulation effectiveness, effects of predation, specifically the effects of common raven predation, 
and the effects of wild horses along with information gained on habitat selection and population uh, performance. And Dow has spent uh, nearly a quarter million dollars on noise research pertaining to sage grouse since 2019 and has plans to invest an additional 400,000 over the next four years. We currently have sound level data collected at 45 different strutting grounds and plan to include up to 100 leks in our ongoing research. We have staff that are uh, plugged in and participating on the range-wide interagency sagebrush conservation team, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency sage grouse conservation assessment team, and the sagebrush executive oversight committee, as well as the national sagebrush conservation strategy team and the sage and Colombian sharp tail grouse technical teams. Approximately 25% of the sage sage grouse priority habitat management area, which was the area reflected in red on the map that uh, elicited so much discussion, approximately 25% of that priority habitat has been lost due to fire since 2000. And that's 2.8 million of 11.4 million acres of that habitat type. We talk about it as it relates to sage grouse, Sage grouse are one of over 350 species in, in that system. There are a number of other species that are garnering additional attention for, for conservation need, uh, namely uh, pygmy rabbits as, as one. There's been 570 mine plans authorized within priority sage grouse habitat, uh, which is, is another challenge and is part of the reason that we're so grateful that the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council is administering a mitigation program for our industry partners, which is allowing Endow uh, to try to focus more on some of those rehab and research efforts for the species and, and in, in the landscape. Wanted to speak to the Habitat Conservation Framework Executive Order. Um, two key pieces in there. One is a, a, sage grouse, a, a sagebrush conservation a plan as well as a connectivity plan. Uh, wildlife corridors are uh, garnered a lot of attention in the last administration through Secretarial Order 3362. That, that momentum and energy has been maintained into the current presidential administration. Department of Interior uh, is continuing to put emphasis and resources towards the identification and protection of connectivity corridors in, in the governor's Habitat Conservation Framework Executive Order, uh, a connectivity plan was specifically called out and will be developed in partnership with the Department of Transportation. Also uh, would be remiss if I didn't bring up the notion of One Health. One Health is a growing uh, construct. Uh, I, I was previously under the impression that it was really kind of, um, you know, that the, the pandemic was the genesis of it. The more I looked, the more I learned that not only has the CDC had a One Health uh, initiative and One Health web, website dating back to 2006, but the concept uh, in medicine is hundreds of years old and with indigenous peoples is probably thousands of years old. The concept is a multi-sector approach that includes human health, ecosystem health, and animal health. 75% of of all uh, emerging pathogens are animal or from animals that are zoonotic in, in nature and 60% of those are from wildlife species. So the better that we can integrate human health, uh, environmental health and animal health, uh, the more effective and, and proactive we can be. The last item I wanted to speak to quickly was Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Uh, also known as RAWA. This is a bipartisan legislation in, in Congress uh, passed out of the House Natural Resources Committee two days ago, a strong bipartisan uh, bill that would create some significant opportunity for us in Nevada would bring a dedicated uh, and sustained $24 million a year to the Nevada Department of Wildlife towards the implementation of our state wildlife action plan that contains 256 of the 895 species we manage and 22 habitats. Uh, that in, those species include bighorn sheep, mule deer, sage grouse, pygmy rabbit, Lahontan cutthroat trout, um, and could be, uh, could be a game changer for us. Uh, of course, it, 
to, to be able to receive that money, spend that money would require legislative approval at, at some point. So we'll keep our fingers crossed and, and keep watching that. For the deeper dive items, we will we'll share uh, these eight items. Uh, there's a 12 minute video that from a commission meeting uh, pertaining to the coyote contest item. I provided a, an overview and introduction on that. Um, the, the five minute video on the Las Vegas building tour, video tour, uh, some more habitat seeding video, just, just two minutes. Uh, the Pyramid Lake Sheep Reintroduction, a, a 10 minute uh, video that tells a, a heartwarming story about returning bighorn sheep to those ancestral lands. Uh, some additional information on Recovering America's Wildlife Act, uh, preview of our, our new webpage. Uh, number seven, a presentation to the commission on license simplification, showing those cost savings and the increase uh, license sales. And then lastly, uh, just an article that, that the agency put out during the pandemic that was silver linings from the pandemic uh, with, that includes the acknowledgement of several personnel and programs in the department that were highlighted um, during, that, during that time period. And with that, just a quick uh, introduction of our team wanted to introduce our two deputy directors, Jack Robb, who's the deputy director over resources and Bonnie Long, who's the deputy director over administrative services, HR and fiscal services. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity and uh, certainly uh, stand for any questions, Mr. Chair, thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, Director Wasley for your presentation. Uh, with that, we will open it up to any members that have questions for the department. All right, we'll start. Assemblyman Ellison, do you have a question or is your hand raised from last time? No, sir, I, I have uh, two questions, if I may. Go for uh, it. Uh, the first one I've got is uh, uh, the current size of our deer herd. Right now, it looks like that our deer herd is uh, depleting across the state. Can you give me a, uh, an update on that? And then the other thing I've got is after that is on the predator control. Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Assemblyman Ellison. So our deer herd is, uh, you are right, our deer herd is declining. It is at <coughs> arguably the lowest level that it's been in, in modern times. Uh, this is another issue and item that is not independent of climate change uh, and, and drought. Um, there, through our research, through some of our recent captures, uh, assessment of body condition, which is primarily done through uh, fat accumulation and the fat that's on, on these animals, whether it's uh, rump fat or uh, xiphoid processed fat or kidney fat. Uh, many of those measures of animal health are, are indicating um, that, that we have some, some habitat uh, related issues. Certainly in some areas, uh, we have high rates of predation and when populations are depressed, high rates of predation can have, be more impactful. Um, I would point out, and I, I listened with, with interest when Assemblywoman Hansen talked about that historical perspective as it pertains to sage grouse. Um, historically, Nevada did not have abundant mule deer. Uh, historically, there were very few mule deer in, in Nevada. When mule deer first started to arrive in Nevada, uh, shortly after the turn of the century, it was noteworthy, it was newsworthy. It showed up in papers. Uh, Miners in the historic mining camps were fed mule deer that were brought in via rail car from adjacent states. Uh, mule deer were, were, had to be trained in, trucked in uh, to feed uh, the masses in, in those mining camps. That, now that is not um, a justification to either ignore the needs or to you know, allow populations to, to shrink or, or dwindle. Um, and that's why we've uh, recently launched the Mule Deer Restoration Initiative. Our game division administrator, uh, Mike Scott, who's a ardent uh, and avid mule deer uh, fan, hunter, supporter, and uh, 35 year plus you know, em employee of, of the agency uh, has made it his personal mission to direct resources towards the recovery of mule deer. Uh, much of that work that we're doing through our habitat division is addressing those needs. Um, we're assessing animal health and and much of the effort through the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council to offset those impacts of industry should also spill over to assist um, in what is 
largely, you know, are probably our, our most iconic uh, and most desirable big game species and, and historically has been our most economically important big game species. So I, I appreciate the question. Thank you. The other question I've got, uh, Mr. Chair, is, is the predator fee. We get that $3 predator fee. How much actually out of that $3 is actually going into predator control? Because it seems like the predator control or the predators are more on the rise than uh, in some areas, uh, mostly up in the higher mountain areas. Can you answer that? Absolutely. Uh, so as indicated, that $3 fee generates uh, approximately $800,000 a year. Of that $800,000, um, it is statutorily mandated that at least 80% of that be spent uh, in lethal control measures. Um, I, I believe that you know we are seeing an expansion in both distribution and density of, of mountain lions. Uh, as we've increased prey distribution, uh, namely through wild horses um, and elk, we see you know, more lions in more places where historically they may have followed migratory mule deer. Now they're able to stay in an area as deer come and go and, and, and switch prey. We have a number of, of projects uh, focused on, on better understanding that relationship to be able to focus those uh, management activities on the most effective means possible and, and, and receive the largest, uh, I'll say the biggest uh, bang for our bucks. Okay, Thank but are, are are we actually are we actually having people on the ground uh, doing something with the lions and you know the coyotes? Uh, I mean, we've got ranchers out there that it's, it's being impacted by by the predators and and if we don't control it now, we'll, it'll then it'll move on to the livestock industry. Thanks, yeah. sir. Thank Sorry, I'm just Thank gonna. Yep. Step in here briefly, Director. Thank you for the for that uh, follow up comment, Assemblyman Allison. I mean, I think that um, you know, Director Wasley's already addressed the question. Um, previous legislation um, explicitly directed eighty percent of the predator control fee towards um, direct lethal removal. Um, I, I understand your frustration. I I have followed a little bit of the legislative history. I know that when the predator control fee was first introduced. It was billed as um, at being able to generate revenue to save our, our falling deer herds. And uh, I know that when uh, legislation was also brought to put in the 80% mandate, um, it was around concern about uh, how it was used and, and continuing declines in, in the deer herd. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, appreciate the concern that you have there. I think I would just ask a clarifying question to to the director, which is, would you say that the, the primary issue uh, affecting deer is essentially increased competition for habitat due to impacts of development, uh, wildfire, invasive species, and the fact that they're competing for habitat with humans, livestock, um, and wild horses Thank and you. other game species? Thank you for the question. My my elevator speech, uh, as it pertains to that question, is that that predator control can allow a population to respond more quickly to favorable habitat conditions. If you uh, do not have favorable habitat conditions, or if you are at carrying capacity because of compromised habitat conditions, whether it be drought, fire, horses, uh, competition that all the predator control in the world will not result in the desired benefit. Um, the key piece of, of receiving benefits from predator control is, is demonstrating that you are below carrying capacity, in, in which case that predator control can allow that population to respond more quickly to favorable conditions. Thank you for that, Director. So it seems like that's the focus that we need to make sure is that we have the carrying capacity on the land um, and have the flexibility to focus on uh, the that as kind of a first priority before moving on to other issues. Uh, Assemblywoman Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. So um, I guess my, my question ties in two of the um, 
your one of your original screens with all the boxes on it when we were talking about 211 and being able to do the analysis on new housing development and the effect on wildlife and then urban wildlife. Um, I remember very distinctly in the Senate when I brought up coyotes in Southern Nevada, got a couple of chuckles from some folks, but we do, we still do have those problems. They're still there. Um, we just had a mountain lion problem very, very recently. I'm, I'm concerned that um, we have housing being proposed on the far east side of the valley. And it sounds like the regulations for 211 will probably not be in place and that law probably, and, and those guidelines will not be in place for this new housing. And it's up in the hills, it's next, it's where a golf course used to be. And we know what happens at night on golf courses. We know what kind of animals come in, uh, especially out of the, the hills in the far east side of the valley. So I, I'm just concerned, I want more information on where we think we're gonna be with 211 in the future and, uh, how are we gonna deal with this, this, these interfaces with the mountain lions, coyotes, wh whatever we have, the more we build out, the more we're gonna have impacts. And being someone who had a constituent that had a coyote stick its head through the dog door, you know, when it happens to, to families in your district, it's, they don't forget about it. It's something that comes up often. So if you could just elaborate on that, that would be helpful. Absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, I think that the main difference as, as we, we view the role of our agency as it pertains to 211 is we're talking about um, design features, we're talking about mitigating, it's, it's a uh, you know, proactive addressing the potential impacts to wildlife before they occur or you know, what kind of mitigative measures or planning uh, should be considered when you know looking for a development and then the reactive aspect on on the back end is how animals respond once that development occurs and so the the roles and responsibilities under 211 versus the agency's roles and responsibilities on urban wildlife uh, i think one is is early on the front end um, as a cost recovery measure to highlight the potential impacts to wildlife and, and fulfill you know, our mission and our role in providing that guidance to try to avoid those impacts. The other, the urban wildlife piece is how those animals and particularly coyotes in Las Vegas where you create these oases of you know, small mammals or house pets or, or other things, attract and draw these animals in after the fact. Um, I don't initially see a really natural nexus between uh, 211 and its intent and our role in that relative to urban wildlife calls issues and, and challenges. However, perhaps if we were to anticipate some of that, that maybe we could uh, incorporate that at the outset and, and maybe have some landscape features or other things that would dissuade or discourage um, you know, those, those coyotes or, or perhaps lions, but where, I mean, you're exactly right, Assemblywoman, and where we, where we saw that lion this, this week, um, it wasn't, you know, out in, out on the edge, out on the, the hills. I mean, it was in a very populated area and it was an animal that we had handled before and it had uh, been ear tagged and relocated back out to the hinterlands and found its way back in, presumably, uh, to find easier and more abundant prey in the form of cats and dogs. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair. Let me put my hand down, because if I don't do it now, it'll stay there. Uh, Thank you, Director Wasley. I really enjoyed the video and the time and effort put into it. Really well done. I uh, brought to mind a couple things I'd like to address, particularly, I think, two areas. Um, the uh, Oh, real quick, though, seeing the video of the bighorn sheep being released into uh, the Pyramid Lake uh, tribal lands was such a highlight. Um, and, and reminder of what a great accomplishment. So thank you for documenting that and uh, so glad to see that happening. Um, also, it reminded me of a tour I took to the fisheries there 
uh, Pyramid Lake uh, that the tribes um, run and the work that they do. And I, that's a great field trip that I highly recommend whether we do it officially or just individually on your own, uh, visiting any of the fisheries, but that one in particular at Pyramid Lake was really uh, such a, a had, a, had a significant impact on and how I could understand the great work they're doing there. So I just wanted to get that on the record. Um, as far as when you talked about uh, Sage, Sage Hin and uh, we talked about their numbers, thank you for uh, clarifying on the map that, that, that red area that 25% you know, has been lost due to fire. So I hope that we will, as we have more meetings, we'll address the fire issue, which we all know it, it is a big concern for habitat and, and a lot of other things, but particularly maybe that we could involve those who live on the land that are, you know, impacted greatly by the fires as well as wildlife to find out what ranching is having to do, how they can help mitigate with maybe, I, I think we've loosened up and allow more grazing, but I think we need to have a discussion as we talk about fires to also do so with grazing in the picture. Um, question about the, the federal protection of ravens and that impact um, that you, you talked a little bit about the, the ravens and, and sage, sage hen. So my question is, I find it um, interesting. We have federal protection on a raven, but that at the expense of another animal. So it, it, what are the efforts how how do you work with the feds on that issue? Uh, is there an inter is there an exchange, um, and are you in support of us uh, trying to get around that federal protection of the ravens if it if it is critical to sage sage hen? Thank you, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman, um, and we are we're engaged um, heavily. And, and let me just little quick background, because ravens are migratory, they're protected under the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So they don't fall under the purview of the state. And in order for us to remove those ravens, it needs to be under authority provided to the state by a federal permit. And that federal permit is issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Migratory Birds. And that permit, the numbers in that permit for removal have to be uh, studied and analyzed through the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Uh, there has been a, a NEPA analysis conducted and performed by one federal agency in USDA Wildlife Services, um, and the population estimates uh, have been increased, updated, that would suggest that there could be more ravens safely removed from that population without any adverse impacts to the population and provide the state um, increased availability to remove those, those ravens. It's a permitting process. I can tell you that at present time, the State Department of Wildlife has an application into uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Migratory Birds asking to increase uh, our ability to remove those ravens. Um, from the landscape, but again, it's a three-step, it's a it's a three-tier process. The way that we look at ravens and the potential impacts of ravens. And number one, it's it's a habitat issue. Uh, do those nesting birds have enough habitat to conceal their nest high? So we we look at at uh, the condition of the habitat. Number two is subsidies. Those ravens depend on food, whether it's roadkill, uh, whether it's a, a dump station or a dump site or a boneyard, uh, they depend on those subsidies. Is there anything being done to limit the availability of subsidies? And then three um, is removal of those ravens. But if we aren't addressing the habitat for nesting cover and we aren't addressing subsidies, uh, then those that there's a less likelihood that the federal permitting entities will see value in us just increasing that permit to go kill more without addressing uh, the ultimate uh, cause, not just a you know proximate solution. So we are uh, in support of it to the extent that we have significantly increased our ask, but we realize that isn't uh, the ultimate, that isn't the end, but it is a a much needed uh, band-aid to ensure that those animals exist on the landscape as long as possible, abundantly as possible, 
to allow us the opportunity to address subsidies and habitat along the way. Great, thank you so much for clarifying what is a very complicated interplay with the feds and the state. And uh, I know it's not an easy job. And uh, so thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, director, if at any point, um, you know, there you can share perhaps some additional information on the, the research around uh, subsidies and, and potential approaches that are used to try and reduce those. Um, uh, I think that would be interesting. It may potentially inform uh, future considerations. So um, with that, we'll move on to Assemblywoman Peters. Thank you, Chair. Um, and just a side note, it is very complicated. Assemblywoman Hanson, that's <laughs> what I built a career on. Um, my question for Director Walsley is about the reseeding efforts um, and habitat restoration programs. And I'm curious if you've been working with UNR, who's been putting in a bunch of effort on um, science around increasing the efficacy of those efforts, particularly the like broadcast seeding piece um, during drought seasons. And I know that this is, this is extra complicated in certain times because we like to see reseeding and vegetation reestablished within a certain time frame. But when we're in those drought cycles, that time frame can be right in the middle of some of our worst drought periods. Um, and so I'm just curious how you guys have been working with UNR or other um, stakeholders doing research in that. And then Chair, if I may, I have one follow-up question for both of the directors who, um, who have pre presented today. Sure. So um, I think that's an excellent question. And please uh, know that, that perhaps 20, 30 years ago, our approach was the more is better with respect to seed and post-fire reveg efforts. We would spend every spare dollar that we could to procure seed and throw it everywhere and, and you know, cast it out there and, and do a rain dance and hope and pray. And, and we were lucky if we could get 25% of a fire covered in terms of seed. And then we were lucky if we had 25% success in that seeding. Our strategies and approaches have, have changed significantly. It's been informed by science. We work with uh, USDA Rocky Mountain Research Station, and we work with UNR, we work with Fish and Wildlife Service, we work with, with many uh, stakeholders, producers on, on the landscape, and we're, we're working in partnership with those partners I just mentioned in, in trying to uh, develop uh, means by which to produce our own native seed to increase the availability, to increase the success. We use uh, predictability models looking at what was on the landscape before the fire to inform the predictability of where we'll have the most success. Where do we have the deepest soils? Where do we have the most soil moisture? Where can we get uh, site selected uh, seeds for species that will be uh, most successful. So it's a far cry from where we started. Um, we probably still have a, a little ways to go, but at this point uh, we're working with federal partners, state partners, industry partners. One of the greatest partnerships that we have right now is with the Nevada mining industry where they have private lands uh, on which we can do things that we can't presently do on federal lands because of a lack of need. But one, one item in particular uh, is a chemical following agent. We can administer uh, indazaflam, uh, rejuva, which is a chemical, you, you referenced a, a small biological window in which to get the seed back on the ground. What, <clears throat> what happens is if you don't get that seed in, historically, if you didn't get that seed uh, sown and, and, and grown in a short period of time, there was a high likelihood that the cheatgrass would uh, invade and then you lose that the window, uh, that biological window goes away. Well, now there's, there's chemicals that we can apply to the soil that will extend that biological window to two or three years. And so, you know, we, we find ourselves in this boom bust scenario where you, you might have a million acres of fire and there's no way you can't get all the seed. You, you have just a couple of months to try to get the seed on. If it's seed that needs to be flown on top of snow, you have these really narrow biological windows and temporal windows in which that all has to happen. But through our partnership with the Nevada mining industry, their willingness to uh, make available some of their private lands to apply uh, a chemical that is demonstrated as safe, 
um, in, in Dazaflam, but hasn't yet been analyzed by the public land management agencies, we're, we're making you know, huge headway and in increasing that, that biological window two to three times, and then also being more strategic on the landscape, looking at those north slopes, looking at those deeper soils, looking at those pockets that had service berry and bitter brush before the fire, and going back into those areas more strategically instead of just you know throwing and hoping. Great question. Yeah, I think you know it's been really interesting to watch the science like kind of um, blossom. Uh, we are using lidar data to identify these areas um, from historic lidar to uh, post fire lidar. It's really been interesting, but I know there are a lot of a lot of folks invested in this area, and I want to make sure that we're not duplicating those efforts and we're working together on them. Um, there is even some interest from tribal partners who on tribal land love to be a partner in establishing native seed programs. So um, I hope that that continues, those partnerships continue to happen. And if I may, with my follow-up question, Chair, um, so we have two, well, one department and one division that work almost exclusively with wildlife, right? So we have your Department of Wildlife, and then we also have the Division of Natural Heritage. And my, I'm curious if you guys, you and Director Crowell could go into what the difference between those two entities are and how their regulatory authority is different um, and why we kind of have these two separate agencies. Yeah, but if, if I may, Chair, I'll, I'll start. Um, and if it, if it provides, I guess, any comfort at all, uh, please know that the division administrator for our division of wildlife diversity was previously the division administrator for the Nevada uh, Heritage Program. Uh, and so she, she brought with her those relationships and that knowledge and that awareness. Um, there are many state wildlife agencies under which uh, heritage programs exist. Uh, there are some heritage programs that exist under NGOs. Uh, for example, the Nature Conservancy ad administers heritage programs in, in some states. Um, and so we, we do have a strong, we have a high degree of overlap in those areas that fall under our jurisdictional authority, uh, which are, are primarily the animals. Um, the area that they uh, have a much broader knowledge uh, authority and awareness um, that, that we don't, it pertains to plants, um, sensitive species, tracking those those plant species. But I would I would uh, certainly let Director Kroll um, expound on that. But just lastly, just say that we have um, strong uh, and positive uh, relationships and partnerships with with the Nevada Natural Heritage Program under under DCNR. Um. And if I may add, as someone Peters, um, Brad Kroll, DCNR director for the record, um, Director Wasley um, pretty much covered it, but that's that's the difference. The, it's now a division of natural heritage within the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and their focus is on um, flora and primarily um, sensitive and endangered flora, so plants in Nevada. They also um, do their best to uh, to inventory and look at insects as well, um, where there's some uh, overlap in jurisdiction and some and some focus that's needed between the two agencies. Uh, but they do work very well together, and um, they do lots of counts together, bat surveys, things like that. So it's a it's a good partnership, but that's the difference. And I can't tell you historically why Nevada set it up the way they did, but it's how it is now. I have one more follow up question, just to reiterate a piece. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so what is the regulatory function for the Division of Natural Heritage? So th th they're mostly focused on um, on collecting and managing uh, data for uh, sensitive ecosystems, uh, plants primarily. And if, a, if the state of Nevada were to uh, uh, consider listing a plant on the state endangered list, it would be a recommendation from the Division of Heritage to the through the Nevada Division of Forestry, which has regulatory authority to list the species. And so that's they are the scientific underpinning for uh, what would be a uh, Division of Forestry regulatory uh, mechanism to list a new species. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Goykachia. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Wosley, I'm just gonna, if you could touch on it at, at least, uh, you know, I can understand the lion in, uh, you know, in Las Vegas and the need for uh, wildlife to uh, move in and remove that animal. But uh, typically when you get a, a coyote call, it was referenced like by uh, Assemblywoman Carlton, uh, a, a coyote sticking his head through the dog door or actually taking a, a, a pet off the, the doorstep and it happens all the time. What's your relationship between uh, wildlife and uh, I'll go to a, the Ag Agency Animal Damage Control? I, you know, in the past, I've had constituents call me from Southern Nevada, have an issue. Uh, you know, a coyote came and took the pet out of the yard. Uh, it didn't fare well. So I, I have reached out to Animal Damage, and they do sometimes go down and remove those animals. But could you just talk on that a little bit? The relationship between wildlife and animal damage control, or and uh, how you hand them off. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Senator. So the uh, the entity th that the Senator is, is asking about is a federal entity um, formerly known as Animal Damage Control, presently known as Wildlife Services. They're under the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant Health Inspection Services, um, Wildlife, Wildlife Services. Um, and they have uh, capacity, expertise, and skills um, that the Department of Wildlife and many state wildlife agencies don't uh, readily have available. So as we, as we have um, some of these urban wildlife challenges, uh, we will often rely upon their skill sets and know-how. We, uh, in most instances, um, we're billed, we're invoiced, and and you know pay for their time and and expertise to to go in and and surgically or strategically um, address those challenges. I, I'll, I'll share that there was a an issue here just uh, oh I don't know a year and a half or so ago. There was a uh, a firefighting crew on their way from uh, I don't know Oregon to Arizona to fight a fire and and uh, stopped somewhere in the Lake Mead National Rec area and threw their bedrolls on the ground. And during the night, one of the firefighters uh, was approached uh, and, and bit in the face by a coyote. Uh, turned out there were multiple coyotes in the area that were, were being fed either directly or indirectly by raiding trash cans. And, and we had a significant issue with a local density of animals that were unafraid and uh, of humans. Um, and so we reached out to wildlife services who came in and spent a few nights in there and did a very uh, professional and strategic and surgical removal of that localized density. Um, and we simply don't have um, the, the know-how, the ability, the equipment to, to perform those kinds of activities. Each, each and every instance is uh, kind of unique unto itself. Uh, we look at, at the offending animal, perhaps the age, gender, uh, you know, is it a one-time occurrence? Was that animal, you know, being fed? Uh, was it encouraged? Is it, is it, you know, we don't jump quickly to, uh, you know, let's just kill it and get out of there. We look at, again, the, the ultimate cause, not just some, you know, proximate solution, but Wildlife Services is a, is a very valued uh, partner and has a unique and necessary skill set. Thank you, Senator. Uh, if I may just follow up on that, Chairman Watts, just quick. But so if, if there is an issue or a problem in a neighborhood or you are being, uh, you're, you have an issue with, uh, uh, with say, a, a predatory working your neighborhood, I'm just going to make it as clean as I can, uh, then typically that constituent would reach out to you or uh, to Endow, and then you would, in fact, uh, relay that on to Wildlife Services. Yes, that, that's correct. Uh, that's that's how it's, uh, and I'm sure every state has a different model. Uh, presently in the state of Nevada, uh, it's, and, and I believe the Wildlife Services prefers it this way, um, un understanding that those animals are under, you know, the statutory charge, they're, they're part of Nevada's, you know, public trust, and uh, they would much rather do that under the direction of the state of Nevada than unilaterally. Um, and so, 
they will, in some instances, if they're contacted directly, turn those you know, calls or individuals over to us or direct those individuals back to us. Uh, we work with our law enforcement, with our wildlife health staff as, as pertinent, as relevant, determine the best course of action. And if the best course of action is to reach back out to wildlife services, ask for their assistance and, and have them you know, invoice us accordingly, then, then that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just wanted to make sure people knew how to access it. And, uh, you know, and I know they still actively work, I think, with their geese populations at the airport and other places. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Members, any other questions for the director and the department? Uh, seeing none, I do have one. Um, so, uh, Director Wasley, you spoke a little bit about uh, the ongoing implementation of the recent legislation, I believe it's 211, around um, uh, you know, uh, housing developments and, and um, wildlife impacts. Uh, could you speak a, at a little bit broader level around both at the federal level and at the state level, the involvement, uh, consultation with the department to determine the potential uh, wildlife impacts um, related to various permitting decisions? Uh, excellent, thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. This is, um, this is something that is not widely or, or, or well understood in terms of the specific uh, roles and responsibilities of, of state wildlife agencies as it pertains to the National Environmental Policy Act. And so the, the state wildlife agencies in all states are the, the entities that oversee that public trust responsibility of wildlife. Wildlife are viewed as uh, belonging to the citizens of the state. Uh, and as such, uh, those state legislatures empower uh, the direct the executive branch agencies um, to you know, represent that public trust and and as such the federal government is required through NEPA to solicit specific input from those state wildlife agencies pertaining to any project that is conducted on federal land or with federal funds any federal nexus requires uh, you know, that, that NEPA analysis and through that NEPA analysis, state wildlife agencies and representing the public's uh, trust in, in those species um, is valued, is, is considered a, a valuable partner, cooperating agency uh, and is, you know, essential input to, to those analyses. When it's conducted, when those activities occur on private lands, um, it's, it's vastly different unless uh, a body like you all uh, takes steps or measures as, as you have, uh, for example, with, with 211 or, or in other instances, uh, like through the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council or, um, you know, where sometimes that land ownership uh, is, is no longer, um, you, you're not exempt from some of those requirements if the state adopts and enacts certain provisions or, or requirements. So, um, I don't know if that gets to your question or if there's um, more that I can try to answer there. I'd be happy to, Chair. Thank you. That that gets us quite a bit of the way there. Um, I think the the other piece is that we do have, um, while, while many decisions um, are under the purview of the federal government, the state does have um, regulatory authority over uh, a, another public trust that we have, uh, water and allocation of water rights. Uh, you know, we, we have a role in the permitting of um, uh, mine uh, activities, various air and water quality um, uh, discharges. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to um, kind of the extent to which the department is um, uh, included, you know, either by statute or, or by practice in, in some of those decisions. I believe the department does have a seat on the environmental commission, um, but if you could just speak to that a little bit, I think that'd be helpful. Um, thank you for the question. That's a little bit more challenging one to answer. You're correct that uh, the by statute, the director of the state wildlife agency uh, has a seat on the state environmental commission. So I've, I've served in that role for uh, nearly nine years now. Um, it's, it's always been incredibly uh, informative to, to get some uh, insight to uh, you know, a lot of the activities in, in the Division of Environmental Protection. Um, 
I, I don't um, see a specific role or responsibility as it pertains to uh, air uh, within the Department of Wildlife. Uh, water, uh, there, there's a little bit more uh, of a role and responsibility because of the, the management of aquatic organisms. And we do as an agency have uh, significant data on water quality parameters, temperature, turbidity, um, you know, flows. Um, and we also have some, some data on uh, contaminants in, in organisms. And, and not too long ago, we were, were challenged um, with, this, with the issue where the Department of Wildlife provided a permit for somebody to harvest you know, fish from a certain body of water. Those fish had a, a certain level of mercury, depending on whether you looked at uh, the EPA or Department of Health, um, you know, that, who had different thresholds. Um, it, it was kind of a conundrum in terms of jurisdictional authorities where the State Department of Ag had authority of exportation of foods. The Department of Wildlife had authority for the take permit, but didn't have any authority over food. The State Division of Environmental Protection um, in coordination with you know, EPA had concerns over consumption, but the State Division of Health um, you know, had, to, had to give their opinion to the Department of Ag, which then wrote a letter in support to the Department of Wildlife. Uh, it was all brought to the attention, to our attention by uh, Division of Environmental Protection. And so <clears throat> there is definitely some overlapping um, areas of, of jurisdiction and authority that, that create, sometimes create some challenges. Um, but I think we're, we all, we're all essentially on the same page and it's just figuring out how to work through that process under our given authorities to, to get to, to the best end. Thank you, Director. I appreciate that. And you know, I think even that example is just helpful to understand some of the ways that sometimes um, there's, uh, it, you know, even if we uh, eventually reach coordination, sometimes there's a, a, a lot of steps because of the different um, responsibilities or jurisdictions that different bodies have. And, you know, I think it's just something that, uh, you know, we, we probably will see some other instances where some things kind of fall into uh, an area where they kind of straddle multiple lines. Um, and also just want to make sure that, you know, uh, given our scarce water resources um, that, you know, the permitting decisions that can uh, impact, uh, you know, spring flow or, or other things that would have a direct impact on wildlife that um, we're making sure we get those um, you know, some information and analysis incorporated on the front end of, uh, of those decision making processes. So. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Senator Hansen, did you have a, an additional question? Yes, I'm sorry. This discussion uh, brought to mind something real quick. I wanted to ask uh, 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 Director Crowell and Director Wasley, um, perhaps if they heard of this report or seen it um, back from Secretary Udall in the 1960s uh, about a lot of the study and mapping of almost a thousand years of mapping from tree rings and different methods on the Colorado River and, and Lake Mead. Um, since, you know, we're, we're of course going to talk about water and um, rye patch was mentioned and that's in my district and it was overflowing two years ago and then here we are with a different situation. Um, just curious that that report um, had shown on the Colorado River uh, and now what's Lake Mead that, you know, in the course of this thousand years, there were sometimes several instances of 50 years worth of drought, a drought period that lasted uh, over several centuries um, in different periods. So I was just curious if some of your studies includes that report. I, I actually have a copy of it. If, if it might be for the edification of the committee and, and for the chair, uh, for us to, I could, I could share that. And, but just curious if, if you're familiar with, because that's a pretty intensive amount of time to have on something as vital as the Colorado River. Just curious if you are aware of that. I am not, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, uh, I'm vaguely familiar with it. There's been multiple reports uh, by 
multiple Udalls, in fact, o- over time. Um, and, um, you know, Brad Udall in Colorado is right now is someone who looks at the Colorado River uh, very closely. Just for clarification, in terms of managing the state's water resources, um, within the purview of the department, um, it falls within the state engineer's office who has a purview for all ground and surface water in the state with the exception of the Colorado River. So that is managed by the Colorado River Commission and the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Um, and uh, as everyone, I think, on, on here knows, uh, you know, uh, 90% of the population in Nevada is served by the Colorado River. Um, in, in, and, you know, in Clark County, there is some ground and surface water in addition to the Colorado that's used in Clark County as well. But the, you know, whether you call it climate change or look at historical records or not, we are the driest, most arid state in the nation. Uh, when there's instances of drought, it strains those resources even more. But what is in contemporary times right now really straining our water resources is uh, population growth and lack of efficiency in the ag sector. Um, and you know we've done great things on conservation. Uh, by our municipal water providers, like Southern Nevada Water Authority, getting, uh, helping get rid of non-functional turf, um, return flows, things like that to help sustain water delivery for homes and businesses uh, as we grow as a state. Um, ag in Nevada is caught in a tough spot because there is no incentive right now under Nevada statutes for um, agricultural water right holders to uh, implement water saving and efficiency efforts because if they use less water under our bedrock water laws, they then are subject to use it or lose it um, and beneficial use um, uh, 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 laws in Nevada. And so you don't want to punish them for being better at conserving water. And so this is something that we tried to move last session. And I hope we discuss in this interim with this committee and look and, and really make progress on next session. But We've got to provide some incentives uh, for agricultural producers to conserve water without being penalized for doing so and help them cover the cost of implementing those technologies. Uh, Ag represents over 50% of our total water use at the state, so we really need to pay attention to it, but do so in a fair, uh, uh, balanced way. Thank you very much for that, Director. Um, Appreciate that. Um, Thank you, Assemblywoman, for the question. Yeah, I I think that um, you hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, figuring out how to uh, make this um, work um, and and also how to fund uh, some of those initiatives as well. As we know um, that the agricultural industry has been struggling um, uh, quite a bit um, and needs uh, assistance in in making some of those those upgrades as well as uh, legal framework to do so. Um, and uh, appreciate the uh, the the um, distinction about kind of the management of the most of the state's water resources and the Colorado River, which is uh, uh, navigated via compact between seven states, um, which has oversight by the federal government and also involves treaties with the nation of Mexico um, and. Uh, and you know uh, some of the latest research by Brad Udall um, shows potentially devastating declines to um, the the river system and Lake Mead levels, um, uh, you know, within the next five to ten years. And so those are those are things that we're hoping to address through strong conservation policy and uh, providing the support that's needed to to conserve here in Nevada and across the region. So, uh, members, any other questions? All right, seeing none, um, thank you again, um, both to Director Kroll and uh, Director Wosley for your presentations to the committee today. Um, you know, we will look forward to um, following up with you if anything else comes up and um, and particularly to uh, DCNR, look forward to hearing from uh, some of uh, your divisions throughout uh, the remainder of the interim. We've uh, now arrived at the last item on our agenda for today, which is our second public comment period. Again, uh, if you'd like to call in, please dial 669-900-6833.
When prompted, please enter meeting ID 860-8513-0058 and then press pound. Our broadcast and production services staff will indicate to you when it is your turn to speak. Please remember to clearly state and spell your name and limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, with that, we will turn it over to our staff in broadcast production services uh, to see if we have any callers in the queue for public comment. And thank you so much, Chair Watts. We are currently on public comment. If you would like to provide public comment at this time, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 222, you're unmuted and may proceed. Hello, for the record, uh, Russell Coleman, R-U-S-S-E-L-L-K-U-H-L-M-A-N. I am the executive director for the Nevada Wildlife Federation. Uh, last year, our state took great strides in protecting our sagebrush ecosystem and wildlife corridors. Governor Sisolak signed the Habitat Conservation Framework Executive Order and AB 211 that Director Wisely mentioned in his presentation, and NDOW has also implemented the Department of Interior Secretarial Order 3362 into their action plan, which focuses on conserving, enhancing, restoring, and improving the condition of priority big game winter range and migration corridor habitat. As these orders and laws take effect, I would like to ask this uh, committee to focus on identifying funding sources for these issues, especially wildlife crossings and solutions that better consider wildlife and habitat impacts on the front end of state permitting decisions. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Coleman. And uh, I'll just take a brief moment to note that that is yet another area where there is a dedicated pool of infrastructure funding. So just for all members awareness, another thing to add to the list to uh, to look out for and see how we can utilize and maximize that. Broadcast production services, can we go on to the next caller? Once again, thank you, Chair Watts. If you've recently joined the call and would like to provide public comment at this time, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Yes, good afternoon. Again, for the record, Fred Voltz, B as in Victor, O-L-T-Z. It was more than a little concerning in listening to a number of comments, questions, and presentations today that finding wildlife species to blame for human-caused problems needs to be highlighted. The issue of over 450,000 head of cattle statewide per the USDA, mostly on publicly owned land and leased from taxpayers, at ridiculously low rates from the Bureau of Land Management has a far greater impact than 53,000 wild horses and burros in Nevada on scarce water and natural forage and overly optimistic cattle carrying capacities. Girding the issue by failing to forthrightly assess the impact of cattle does a huge disservice to all Nevadans, including rural counties. Scant resources are being applied toward humane birth control methods if the guesstimated numbers are even accurate. A large number of wild horses have been brutally rounded up, expensively imprisoned in substandard conditions for committing no crime but originally existing through human neglect, and are often sold off for slaughter elsewhere. Why isn't the state working with the feds to stop the ongoing carnage? Similarly, Please don't demonize apex predators for doing what comes naturally when the number of deer killed in approved annual hunts by humans far exceeds the predator-inflicted death toll. Why do we have human deer hunts when the deer population isn't even given a chance to recover from drought and poor habitat? A week from today on the agenda of the Wildlife Commission, with the endorsement of NDOW, is another annual deer hunt. How is this good stewardship of Nevada's wildlife assets? Is it just about NDOW selling more licenses? Each wildlife species has a place in the ecosystem, be they predators or not. 
Humans did not create the ecosystem and should not try to play God with it as they foolishly claim to manage the incredibly powerful forces of nature. Killing is not conservation, it is permanent destruction. Engaging in programs that have an end goal of keeping a steady supply of wildlife available for recreational killing can't be ignored. Regarding urban wildlife interfaces, it seems one of the solutions is for county health departments to work with state agencies in encouraging the human population not to leave food outside for wildlife and to protect their domestic pets from peril. Pets cannot be left outside, even in a fenced yard, without risk to their safety. Thank you, and I would ask that these comments be added verbatim to the record. Thank you, Mr. Holtz, Broadcast Production Services. Can we go on to the next caller? Your watch your public line is open and working. However, there are no more callers at this time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, well, members, that concludes our meeting for today. Uh, the next meeting of our Joint Interim Standing Committee will be on Monday, February 28th. Thank you all for your time and attention. This meeting is adjourned.